Hey there, folks, your favorite pimp hand. Well, the only pimp hand, the pimp hand of America here. And uh, uh, let me give you a quick update, quick update. The weekend leading into the 4th of July, we had the Patriot Fire Team training camp. It was fantastic. We had a whole bunch of you guys come out and uh, live and function and train like free men. That's fantastic. And we're going to do a uh, an after action for that very soon. But right now, it is the 4th of July week, the week of 4th of July, and we decided, you know what, we could use a little bit of a break. So that's what's about to happen. You're going to get some best of, thanks to Zachary, and Zachary, thank you. You're very welcome. Yes, thanks to Zachary, you guys are going to get some best of stuff, and then we will be back, and when we come back, we're going to talk to you guys more about training opportunities that you should take advantage of. Uh, in the very near future. So sit back and relax. I hope you guys all had a fantastic 4th of July holiday. Uh, Spent some time with your family and friends and appreciated uh, this country that we call the United States of America. And if you're listening to me overseas, well, you can just, uh, well, you can thank us for being in existence. Thank us. (laughs) Other than that, I don't think I have much more to say, uh, but uh, Have a great four. I hope you had a great fourth of July, and uh, we will talk to you uh, live again next week. How's that sound? That sounds pretty good to me. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here, we don't just talk about guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drip ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co host. Founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping ogre, Zach. Now, give it up for your beloved host, the Pimp Hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. All right, my question for you is what is the color of victory? Pink. Pink. Mm. What is the color of victory? Uh, I, I, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. You did that. Remember, this is a family friendly show. That's, that it is. I didn't That's say anything. A family that friendly show. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. No, no, it's, it's interesting to me to, that, ha- that people will have um, debates or arguments or they want to have arguments about. Uh, the color of guns and how guns shouldn't be a certain color or they should be a certain color. Like, you know, it's an inanimate object, right? Yeah. You know that it can't do anything on its own of its own volition, right? Yeah. Uh, And that painting it one color or another, if, if you color a gun black, white, red, orange, green, blue, purple, whatever. It doesn't make it any more dangerous and doesn't make it any less dangerous. But what is the color of victory? No, well, I like to think that, uh, that uh, you know, olive drab green perhaps is the color of victory. That's the one that we embraced. Uh, we embraced the olive drab green during World War II, and I guess we won that one. Is that the last one that we, like, well, no, we won the... We kind of did. We kind of won the Gulf War, the first war. We won the first one, and then we surrendered in the second. So there's that. But what is the color of victory? You can dis- The great thing about being an American is you can decide for yourself. Yeah. I just gave you permission to make that decision for yourself. Now, you can get slightly darker black or World War II olive drab green, or you can get coyote brown or flat dark earth or whatever you want to do, man. You're an American. You're an American. If you want to learn how to dirt coat like a pro, uh, I suggest that you follow the link. It's in the show notes. Go to Duracoat University, and uh, you will learn how to dirt coat like a pro, and you can be that guy in your group of friends. You can be that guy in your city, your community, your neighborhood that can be relied upon to put a fantastic Duracoat finish on shotguns, rifles, pistols, anything, anything you want, man. I was actually uh, had a situation where Duracoat uh, is is going to, in the very near future, come into play. I had a, uh, I picked up a nail in my truck tire 
And so I was, I had to put the spare on, but it was, it was good. It was, it was okay. I mean, it, nobody wants to have a flat tire and nobody wants to have to put a spare on, but if you do, you want to have all the stuff, right? So I had prepped myself so that I had everything I needed to do that. And I was able to change the tire in 10 minutes uh, or so. And, uh, but I pulled out and if you guys are truck drivers, if you have a truck, where's the spare go on the truck? Well, unless, unless you just like using up some of your extra bed space for a tire goes underneath, right? They put mine on the roof. Yeah. But here's on the roof. I put mine on the roof like they do in Africa. Uh, but, <laughs> but uh, where does your spare tire rim live? It lives under the truck, right? And uh, I pulled my spare off and I put it on the truck and it looks like, mm -hmm. like, oops, this is still the public one. It looks bad. Uh, it's rusted. It's got rust marks on it and all over the, and I looked at that and I thought, mm, okay. So once I get the tire situation fi fi fixed, what we need to do is we need to sandblast that rim and I just need to go ahead and this we you speak what, of. who is this we you speak of? We need to sandblast that rim and uh, put some Duracoat on that sucker, call it good, and move on with their lives. Yeah, so that was that's what I'd be thinking. So if you want to Duracoat things, you can Duracoat guns, you know, shotguns, rifles, pistols, but you can Duracoat the rim, your truck rims, if you want to. Just make sure you're not going to drive it for two weeks. Yeah, just prep them. You know, prep it. Uh, and once once I do that, you know, once I once I sandblast and and Duraco with the rim, I'll just leave it. You know, and we'll put it on the truck, and we'll be on the truck going. So, <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. So, uh, if you want to do that, get your butts over to DuracoatFirearmFinishes dot com. Tell them Student of the Gun sent you, and you can Duraco whatever you want because you're an American, right? Uh, that's right. Oh, uh, it says learn about being a first time gun buyer at highpointfirearms.com. High dash point firearms.com. Did you put that note in there about learn how to be a first time uh, a, being a first time gun owner? Who put that in there? I did. Zach did. Good job, Zach. All right. Please elucidate. You can go to high dash point firearms.com. And then you can scroll down a little bit. We'll put a direct link in the show notes for you so you can get them directly from there. But you it says first time gun buyer. Ah, you no know one. Learn the basics. Get questions answered here. Ah, it's a hyperlink. Yes. And it's first time gun com is the link for you. And it gives you all the information you need. That is that is very interesting because I think someone who looks a lot like us has, has a thing called first time gun owner. No, no. My first gun. Oh, my first gun. Yeah, my first gun. Oh, uh, yeah, we did a thing called My First Gun. Uh, a long time ago. A while ago, yeah. My first gun. Uh, it, it sounds like a children's toy. <laughs> it's like the like when you when you buy a guitar amplifier kit when they they sell you the everything you need to start playing and it's just a little guy. It's the baby's first amplifier. It's so myfirstamp.com, <laughs> myfirstgun.com. So there you go. Uh, thank you very much to High Point for providing that. And it's a, you know, a lot of us, we, we've been, when you do things for so long, you just assume that everybody knows. Oh, uh, the topic of the day ammunitions. Yes, indeed. Well, come on, Paul, we already, we, we get it. Um, I this weekend I decided to conduct a little experiment. I went to a, a large, uh, not the biggest, Real but quick. we didn't actually play the music. Oh, we got to play the Brownells intro music. Yeah, do that. But a bump. Now it's official. Uh, now it's official. Yeah, official Brownells bullet points music. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I was uh, in the Salt Lake Valley this weekend just for a little bit, and I decided I was going to conduct an experiment. Uh, I went to a large gun shop. I went to a large gun shop, and I asked them to purchase black powder. Now you're like, black powder? Like all powder is black or grayish. It's all grayish or black. No, no, I mean, I mean black powder, like 
the powder that produces smoke because uh, I do muzzle loading. I, I enjoy muzzle loading uh, very much. I have a flintlock Kentucky rifle. Or that's actually, is it, no, it's a Pennsylvania, is it a Pennsylvania long rifle? Yeah, it's a Pennsylvania long rifle, 50 caliber flintlock. And you cannot and you should not attempt to use, quote, modern smokeless powders and something like that. Because if you do, you're going to fail miserably. It's going to be a bad, it's going to be a bad day. Well, went in, asked him, and the guy's like, well, I'll have to go back to the powder locker. Because smokeless powder, not smokeless powder, uh, black powder has to be kept in a powder locker. They don't just stick it on the counter. Uh, you will not find it sitting on a counter in a gun shop. You have to ask for it. If you don't know that, you're, you're like, yeah, I, I go to my place. And I looked and, and they didn't have it. I'm like, yeah, they did. They had it in a designated powder locker somewhere else. And he said to me, he goes, well, I'm going to have to check because I don't know how much we have, because we haven't been getting it. I said, oh, okay. Uh, And and it comes in different grades. There's there's single F. It's measured by single F, double F, triple F, and then the really fine stuff that you you would use just in a a flash pan, or it would be 4F. I don't ever use 4F. Uh, I generally just use single F is like for uh, muskets or cannon or whatever. But I used two or three. Long story short, he came back out. He said, hey, I've got two. Two uh, containers of 3F. Do you want them both? And I said, well, since you took the time to go all the way back to the powder locker, the answer is yes, I will take them off of your hands. Is that anecdotal? You're like, ah, that's just your shop. That doesn't, that's not indicative of the whole world. I don't know whether it is or not. My question to you would be, is that indicative? Have are you guys out there? Are any of you guys out there muzzle loading guys? Uh, you're like, oh, I just get the stuff from Walmart. I get the the Pyrodex or whatever. I hate Pyrodex. I just do. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna muzzle load, I'm gonna use pure black powder. I don't like the Pyrodex. I don't like the the substitutes. They're just as dirty and they rust. Uh, and black powder, a it, to me, it's 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 the true thing. So. If you are a muzzle loading guy and you haven't purchased powder in a while, because I know a lot of you guys, you're like, I buy one can a year or one can every two years and I keep it fresh and I don't worry about it. You might want to check with your local dealer. And, and well, you know, Jared, uh, one of the anecdotes is the sm- small shops generally don't carry it. I went to one and uh, they're like, yeah, we don't carry that. You have to order it. And and can you order it? Yes, you can order it. As an American, you can order it and have it delivered to you, but you will have to pay a uh, over-the-road hazardous material uh, delivery charge plus shipping. And that's usually like 30 to 40 bucks for the hazmat shipping plus regular shipping. So you end up paying more in shipping than the unit actually costs itself. And to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so now is the time. Check your powder. Check your powder supplies. And when you get powder, put that in a container that is airtight, watertight, and they, you don't have to worry about it getting wet or moist or whatever. Uh, sometimes moist is good and sometimes it's not. The time to buy ammo is yesterday. If you go to Brown Elf, you're like, well, does Brown Elf sell black powder? Mm, I don't think they do. I'm sure. Let's go ahead and look. I don't remember if they have actual black powder or not. Black, 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 black powder. Uh, I see muzzle loading propellant, but I don't see any black powder. Black. Yeah, I I, hit, I clicked black powder and I got. Uh, here we go. Uh, black horn powder. Uh, what is black horn powder? High performance muzzle loader propellant engineered for modern inline, but it's his black horn muzzle loading propellant. I bet you that's like a triple seven or a pyrodex or something like that. If you want black powder, uh, generally Goex is is the way to go. 
and I don't believe they sock it because the, the fact is it is a hazardous material and you do have to pay for has, hazmat shipping fees. And most people, you can do it, but most people aren't going to. You know, if you're paying $24 for a pound and it's $37 hazardous material shipping fee, you're like, but regular ammunition, they still are listing the what they're calling the ammo blowout. They have they're running sales on 22 10 mil, 10 millimeter, Celier uh, and below, Celier and below ammunition that you can put in your JXP. Uh, PMC 5.56 is on sale. Uh, the 5.7 by 28, which did we talk about that being the cartridge? Um, of the show, but I don't remember if it was on air or if it was off air. Yeah. Every year when I, when I go to shot tour, every time I go to shot show, I I pay attention because there's, there's always trends. There are trends in calibers and chamberings. Um, you know, one year it seemed like everybody who was making rifles was making a 338. Like all of a sudden everybody had a 338 Lapua. And then, uh, you know, I went another year and all of a sudden everybody had a compact 380. Everyone was introducing a new compact 380 or whatever. So th- we have these trends, six, five Creedmoor a few years ago, what, four or five years ago, everyone had a six, five Creedmoor Ruger, Savage, Remington, Mossberg, name it. Everybody had a six, five Creedmoor. So that is a, it's a trend. We see trends. And the trend this year was 5.7, 5.7 by 28, which is kind of weird because it's been around for a while, and it's been around so long that it's kind of weird that it's being treated as if it's a new thing because it's not really new. Uh, FN was making a 5.7 pistol over 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, maybe 15. I'm not sure how long ago it's been since the F- FN 5.7 pistol. Uh, but it's out there, and it's available, and now Smith & Wesson has one, and Ruger has one, and FN obviously had them, has them, and PS Arms, PSA has one, and kel has one. kel actually has a couple of different ones. Um, so, yeah, the 5.7. Uh, I actually looked into a couple of years ago. It was two years ago. Uh, they were running barn burner discounts on the Ruger 5.7 pistol. And I thought, man, that would be a good close-up varmint, like for shooting prairie dogs and varmints and stuff within 25 yards. That'd be a, that'd be a great cartridge. And the price on the pistol was was price to move. I was like, oh, that's a good price. Then I realized that you couldn't get ammo because two years ago you couldn't buy a round of five seven, and if you could find it, it was two bucks a shot. And I was like, uh, I'm not going to shoot desert rats for two bucks a shot. Sorry. So I just passed. Well, it's not two bucks a shot anymore. It's about 75 cents a shot uh, when you find it, but it is out there and it is available. So if that's your bag, man, if that's something you're into, uh, well, then get on it. Get on it. If you're really serious about uh, ammunitions, uh, you can purchase a steel drum of 762 by 51 NATO. For $9,999, that would be 7,500 rounds, and it comes with a drum that you can reuse. I mean, who doesn't need a steel drum, right? Um, <laughs> if you don't need that much, you, you can get it by the box or the case. <laughs> but they do have a steel drum. Remember about five, six years ago when, when Brownells was offering steel drums of 556 five, and people laughed? All right, I never want that much. And then 2020 rolled around, and I was like, oh, that would have been. If I'd have bought one of those back then, that that would have been a pretty smart investment. Yeah, yeah, it would have. Yeah, it would have. So now is the time. The time is now. Go to your ammo locker and do an inventory and do what you, you know, you're an American do whatever you think your career can handle. And you know, people are like, well, how much should I buy? And I'm like, I don't know. How much are you going to shoot? Are you planning to train at all this summer, this spring? 
this next year? Do you want to train during this next year? Yes, you do. Then the time to purchase ammunition for that endeavor is now. Not April, not May, not June. Now. Because uh, now is because let you guys want a little let me let you in on a little secret. All the normies, the average gun owner, the the you know, the dabblers, they're all involved in other stuff mentally right now. They're worried about the stupid bowl and and sports ball and it's cold and they just got out of Christmas and so they're not shooting and so they're not even thinking about it. So the prices that the the volume is coming up and the prices are coming down. Now the price there if you're waiting for 2019 prices, if you're waiting to pay 17 cents a shot for nine ball and then you're going to buy it, I don't think it's going to happen. I could be wrong. It happened once before, but I I don't see that happening. If you're waiting for 20 cent 556 five, to pop around, it's not going to happen. Now, something that I did notice when I did my little browsing and shopping uh, this weekend is that uh, there was tons of ammunition on the shelves in the gun shops, but that crap is full. Oh, wow. Well, I, I went in there with Nancy, and she's like, she goes, well, what are the prices like? And I'm like, it makes it hurts my stomach. It hurts my tummy to look. Uh, the shops... I don't know, Jared, is is it they just can't compete so they don't even try the shops because, all right, I'll, I'll give you a great no example. Idea. They had bulk. Well, we know the one that we did the instructor development class at, that one was actually pretty good pricing. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what the. Yeah, the, the, the uh, we don't need to doing. say it, but the one that I went to, they had bulk 9 mil and their bulk price for 9 mil ball was 44 cents a shot. That's not. Oh, wow. No, thanks. Because you can get it online right now for right around 25 cents a shot. If you buy it in case lots, uh, and if you watch, if you pay attention, a lot of these people, if you buy a case, they'll give you free shipping. Uh, so you say, well, the, the difference between 25 cents and 44 cents is not a big deal. It is when you're using, when you're buying 500 rounds. Um. So the ammo is there. This is what I'm going to tell you. It's there. It's available. The old, you know, the, the stuff from two years ago, people are like, I can't find ammo. I can't find it. I don't know where you guys are finding ammo. No, ammo's there. Now, you just have to ask yourself, am I willing to pay the price for it? And that's, that's, that's an individual thing. And the last thing I'm going to say is this. If you're listening to me in the United States of America right now, you need to understand that the United States of America is the only country in the world where shooting and firearms ownership and the ability to just say, you know what, today I'm going to take my guns and go shoot them. We're the only country where the peasantry, where the common man can do that. Every other country in the world The shooting sports is reserved for the ruling class elite and the wealthy because they're the only ones that can afford to do it. Understand this. In the United States of America, we are the only country where the common man can readily, at any time, day or night, decide to enjoy that freedom. Everywhere else, it's tremendously restricted, and it's expensive. And we've gotten a little bit spoiled. Uh, you know, when you talk, if, you, if you meet a foreigner, if you meet someone from Europe or any other country where they're allowed by their masters to shoot guns, and they find out how much we pay for ammo, they're like, it's like, you guys are stealing it. So... Uh, Understand that I know, you know, you're looking at the price and you're like, man, I don't want to spend that much. From a a realistic standpoint or practical standpoint, it's still way less than you would have to pay anywhere else. So keep that up in mind. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on. Bada, 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 bo. 
boom, bam, boom, bam, boom, bam. Dangerous from Madison Rising. Yes, indeed. Because that's what it's all about here. You need to be dangerous on demand. Whether you're a dude, whether you're a chick, uh, and that's it. There's only dudes and chicks. There's nothing in between. Uh, you need to be dangerous on demand. All right, well, we're, we're going to talk about a dude who should have been dangerous on demand. Um, or his buddy should have been, I don't know, but, uh, this, <laughs> so we talk about bears. I wonder what Mr. Pogue thinks about this. Mr. Pogue, the wildlife expert who says you should never carry a gun in the woods because you're more likely to shoot yourself than you ever are to need one to protect yourself from a wild animal. That's Mr. Pogue. Yes, that's Mr. Pogue, the uh, fornication cranium. The fornicate cranium. Is it, would, it be, would fornication cranium be the correct? I think, I think that would, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we're going to be dangerous. I'm going to be dangerous on demand. I'm dangerous on demand right now. I'm sitting in my chair in my studio, and I, I'm strapped. Biatches, because you're not going to get a postcard that says P.S. at 11:43 a.m. You will need a gun. That's not going to happen. You just got to do it. So and if it did, you'd be like, okay. You're like, all right, I'm going to take a rifle. Uh, Either a, I'm not going to yeah. go there, or b, I'm going to have a yeah. rifle in my hand. Uh, <laughs> we got a story from WDTN.com, Channel Two, Dayton. Like, well. Well, what's going on in Dayton? What's going on in Ohio? Who wants to read this? Oh, one? H. Oh, H. I'll do it. It's oh. the zebra bites man's arm off in Ohio before being put down. And this is from Circleville, Ohio, which is right outside Columbus. Which is, yeah, between Columbus uh, and Chile mistaken. Coffee. Yeah. Uh, I believe that Circleville is We've close to there. where they had the state fair, wasn't it? Yeah, we've we've been through Circleville. Yeah, many times. many times. <clears throat> uh, a man was taken to the hospital Sunday afternoon after a zebra attacked him in Pickaway County. According, you know what it is. This zebra inhaled all those chemicals, and he became a dude. Super I'm zebra. I'm saying I he the zebra like zombified, freaked out from all the from the poison in the ah. air in Ohio. According to an incident report from Pickaway County Sheriff's Office, deputies were sent to the 6900 block of Darby Road in Circleville at around 5.30 p.m. to a fenced-in field after hearing reports a man had his arm dismembered by a zebra that he owned. Wow. As deputies arrived, they saw the victim laying on the ground with his right arm covered with his sleeve. The incident report said the victim had his arm bitten off by the zebra. Like, just gone. <laughs> That's a story to tell. At least he's got a good story to talk about. Well, the, the thing is that they're, they're probably be able to get it back on. Hopefully if somebody put it on ice and hauled it to the, yeah. to the uh, emergency room, they'll probably be able to put it back on. But. While deputies were treating the man, the zebra continued acting aggressive and charged one deputy cruiser that was positioned to block the animal from the man. The man was accompanied by family members while he was being put in an ambulance as the zebra continued acting hostile. I can't wait till we get to the good part. Oh, yeah. Deputies began blowing air horns and yelling at the zebra to scare it away, but it continued to charge toward authorities and the victim's family members. They told the deputies not to turn their backs on the zebra since that was when it would attack and gave them permission to put down the zebra if necessary. I'm glad they got permission. Yeah, the man. you know what the crazy thing is? not just the arm being like mangled and whatnot. This is an expensive loss for this family. A deputy then fatally shot the zebra in the head due to its continued aggressive behavior. Whew. One account from the a PCSO deputy in the incident report says that the zebra was aggressive due to being protective of about five or six female zebras that were in the field. After the zebra was killed, the man was taken to Grant Medical Center for his injuries. So the zebra was a simp. Uh, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> That's funny. So uh, here's the deal. 
Uh, so here's the deal. In this in the the video, it doesn't say that a tourniquet was applied to the man. Not in the story. In the story, which okay, hey, channel two. There, wait, that is on, a there, Okay. There's a video here, Zach, if you want to while well, dad's talking right now, if you want to pull that up and see if you can yeah, get it. Yeah, so in the we'll video, you see the deputies pulling out a tourniquet. And they put a tourniquet on the man's arm to stop the massive hemorrhage from killing him. So you'd think, perhaps, that that might be uh, an important part of the story. Like, oh, and P.S., deputies applied a tourniquet to the injured man to save his life. Nah, that's not yeah, important. But- that that part would have lost his arm because the the nerve damage from the tourniquet. Yeah, would've... but now he's going to lose his arm because of the tourniquet. Like, wait, what? <laughs> what? What? What now? Yeah. So, uh, homeboys, and uh, what what I what I appreciate uh, in the uh, in the story here is that the Pickway County Sheriff deputies, uh, homeboys are are, are rocking the eight seventies. There's yeah. no, they're not putting you patrol rifles. They're rocking the eight seventies here, man. And, uh, it's how long is this video? Do we have enough time? It's two it? minutes, but I don't think this is the right video. Is it? I, I don't know. Cause the video that I watched originally, you know what this might, what might've happened, Jared, you know how news sites continuously update their stories. Cause yesterday yeah. when I watched this video, I saw the deputy, pulling out a tourniquet in his hand because I recognized that it was one of those you know what tourniquets uh not our not our not the ones that we like but uh and running over to the dude and I saw in there that that the you know a, a tourniquet was applied to the victim's arm to stop the massive hemorrhage from killing him uh so the the wonderful thing about this do, do we still want to play the video is there um, enough? Is there valuable information in this video? I don't know. I don't know because this isn't the video that I watched. So potentially, now, it, it, what the heck? I, You're here. I'm here. We're all here. Play right. it. So, <laughs> if this has no valuable audio whatsoever, we apologize. Oh, yeah. As his Pickaway County County deputies responded to reports of a zebra biting a man's arm off. This body cam footage of them looking at the zebra and them on the scene. I do not see the man with his arm bitten off. Someone's getting a phone call. They're walking around uh, the they're zebra. Talking to, I think that's the buddy that they're talking to right now. Trying to figure out what happened. Yeah. Is there a way for him, for you to keep him back? We're trying not to shoot him, but... <laughs> the 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 muzzle control of these guys is great because there's a dude running out trying to chew the zebra away and they uh the zebra was close and the dude was pointing a shotgun at him and then the the guy i think it's the buddy of the victim here ran over to try to shoo him away with a stick or whatever and the the cop immediately Races, raises his yeah. shotgun but you don't you don't always see that happen. No, no. I, I will say there's something kind of scary about this, which is when you think, oh, animal bites off man's arm, you think like snarling and foaming at the mouth and like Grr. No, this is just a normal zebra walking around. Yeah. Like if you were to be walking down the street and see that zebra, it's like, oh little horsey, look at it. Not having any idea of that just mutilated a man. Yeah. So Yeah. <laughs> I think the dude's already in the ambulance in this video. Uh, they might, yeah, they might be. So, all right, that, I guess that's that. And and of course, they 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 stopped it before the the deputy fired his gun and and shot the zebra and because affecting people's sensibilities. Here's yeah, the, yeah, so here's the deal. In case you're like, what is the deal, Paul? I don't know what it is. I'm I'm gonna tell you. Uh, I sent the, you know I sent uh, this to my good friend Bill. Because I knew that I didn't know if he saw it night, but I knew that Bill would appreciate this. Yeah. Because Bill has he has uh, put down many a zebra, <laughs> and has proof and evidence of such 
uh, in his trophy room. For those of you that are that are not students of animal biology, or here's the deal: zebras for like a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand years, people have tried to domesticate zebras, and it essentially always fails, right? Uh, horses, horses, beasts of burden, right? Your draft horses, horses that you that pull plows, horses that you ride on their back, horses that you put on chariots, and yada, yada, yada. Now, we like to see movies and cartoons and stuff where they're like, oh, they had a, a chariot pulled by a zebra. That was really cool. Here's the deal. Man has been trying to make zebras domestic work animals for thousands of years. And guess how successful that's been? It is not. <laughs> it has not been successful because zebras are mean. <laughs> See, anybody talk to any like the funny thing is I liked I like to believe that there are English speaking and reading people in Africa right now like Kenya, Zimbabwe, Zaire, South Africa, you know, Uganda, that are that are watching this, and, and they're all like, duh, zebra kill you, man. What are you, are you crazy? <laughs> are you crazy? <laughs> Zebras will kill you. They will stomp you into the ground. <laughs> and people are like, I don't know how a zebra could bite someone's arm off. Have you ever been close to a horse's mouth? Do you know how big a horse's mouth actually is? Because someone said in there, they're like, I don't think a zebra could bite someone's arm off. You don't think that? Based on your TikTok experience? Based on my experience watching one-minute TikTok videos, I don't think a zebra could do that. Like, have you ever been to it? Like, have you ever seen a horse, like, been, like, up close to it? Do you know how powerful a horse's jaws are How and how big their mouths actually Not are? Not as powerful as an alligator, so there. No, yeah, but there's, like, I don't think a zebra. I love people on, on the social media. I don't think that a zebra could bite someone's arm off. And then have you ever been bitten by a child? You ever been bit? All right, people have been like, bitten by horses. A uh, horse by a human is, child? Yeah. Have you ever been bitten by a human child? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think a zebra or a horse could definitely bite an arm off. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, are you kidding? Yeah, uh, and and zebras are mean. They're freaking mean animals. I knew this 20, 30 years ago. How do people to they're cool looking? Don't get me wrong. I mean, they're they look cool, but they're mean. Zebras are mean, man. And they always have been. And this is this is the crazy thing. It's like, you know what wild animals are? Wild. They're wild. And they're animals. Uh wild animals are wild. Uh, but the, the biggest question that was not answered by Channel 2 WTDN Ohio was, did they have zebra steaks shortly thereafter? See, the, the, the folks in Kenya and Uganda and Zaire, they read that story and they're all like, hey, they're going to eat that, right? It's like, it's like Peter Griffin. Are you going to eat that? Mr. Griffin, that's a stapler. You want to split it? Mr. Griffin, that's a zebra. You want to split it? Mm. <laughs> if they didn't eat that, then they're, they're, they're messing up, man. They're, they're wasting food, wasting protein. Let me tell you what people in Africa don't do. People in Africa don't waste protein. If, you, if they would have shot that thing in South Africa... The, the villagers would have been out there with their knives and zip, zap, zoop. That thing would have been steak. It would have been. Oh, uh, were you there? Were you there with Bill when when they were talking about uh, when he was talking about how they leave when they're done? There is nothing left but a red spot on the ground. Oh yeah, they use everything. Yeah, when when you you 
bam, the zebra goes down. Woof, here come the villagers. Shoop, 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 shoop. They leave. There's nothing left behind but a red spot on the ground. They don't waste protein. And people are like, oh, they're, they're shedding tears. I'm waiting for the people to go out and, like, do a memorial and put flowers out for the zebra. Dude, it's an animal. Just eat it. Make a cool rug. I hope they made a cool rug out of it. I had to yeah, actually use it. <laughs> yeah. A good, I sent a good friend of mine uh, that story, and he said, he goes, am I a bad person for my first thought being, what load did they use to put that thing down with? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny he's like my first thought is well what load were they using mm-hmm. i want to know um but if you're wondering could a 12 gauge take down a zebra a, an adult male zebra the answer is yes the answer is yes so uh there you go there you go <laughs> oh come on man yeah what are the animals are pure like little bambies and stuff no, animals actually are wild, and 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 most most animals in the wild would just as soon stomp you in the ground, <laughs> or have you for dinner, uh, or just you know, then they, they yeah, it's not this life is not a Disney movie. <laughs> just in case you're wondering, life is not a Disney movie, uh, and wild animals can and will maim you. So there you go. So cat in the hat, there's actually, see, this is a twofold story. So number one, we had a wild animal. And they're like, well, they bought it and it's in a, it's in a field. I'm like, okay, congratulations. It's still a wild animal and zebras are still mean. Uh, and they were able to tourniquet this dude's arm. So if, if you were there, if you were the only person there and you saw this happen, could you, and you're like, well, and. They're like, well, why would you want to shoot it? Well, what if I'm trying to put, if I'm trying to render first aid to homeboy here who's on the ground going, ah, my arm. And, you know, Zippy the zebra comes up and he wants to bite my arm off. Like, I don't think so, Jack. Zippy the zebra. And folks are like, why did they, why didn't they taser it? Let me explain something to you kids out there in the audience. Once a wild animal decides, you know what? I don't know what that thing over there with two legs is, but I'm going to take a bite out of it. Once they decide that it, once an animal decides that it's cool to bite, attack, kill a human, they don't go back. You know, you, you can't send a zebra to counseling and sit down with it. It's like, you know what? That was wrong. And I understand that biting that guy's arm off is wrong. And I'm not going to do it anymore. Promise. No, because that's, here's the deal. If the deputies wouldn't have killed it, what would have happened is the, uh, the ODNR or the, or the county game officials, the county game warden would have either the game warden or the, uh, I don't know, maybe the dog catcher. <laughs> um, they would have ordered it, a judge, or would have ordered the animal destroyed, okay? So if the deputies wouldn't have shot it right then, that, that here's the deal. When the, as soon as the zebra bit the dude's arm off, it pretty much signed its own death warrant because there was, there was no point in time where they were going to say, you know what, it's cool. It probably won't do it again. Yeah, that's not how that works. Mm-hmm. So... And they're like, well, they got permission from the family. Isn't that nice? Doesn't it make you feel warm and fuzzy? <laughs> so if the family would have said no, they're like, all right, well, just let the zebra keep attacking people. I don't care. Whatever. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as promised, we have Yehuda Reamer, also known on the uh, on the socialist media and the internet as the Pew Pew Jew. Pew 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 Pew. Welcome, Yehuda. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to be back. It's been a while. Yes, it has. What is your shirt? I see gun control is, and I don't see the bottom. Gun control is not kosher. <laughs> there you go. It is not. It is not kosher. All right. So uh, did you make it? Did we miss you at NRA or were you not there? 
So unfortunately, I didn't make it this year. NRA okay. a lot, NRA a lot of times, and again, I'm obviously I'm not expecting them to cater to the Jewish world, but a lot of times it coincides with Passover. Um, so gotcha. Passover ended Thursday night. The NRA show started Friday, and for me to brush and try to make it. Plus, I'm not going to be there on Saturday, and it's just not worth going just for a Sunday. So. There you go. It's usually, it was actually way early this year. Normally, it's like the like April 29, 30, and May 1st, or the 30th, and the 1st and 2nd, something. For whatever reason, they had to push it up a couple of weeks this year. So. Yeah. So, it was annoying. I mean, I, I enjoyed going, and I've never been to Indianapolis, so it would have been a cool trip to go to. But it is what it is. Uh, I've become very used to it, uh, missing a lot of things that happened over the weekends just comes with the territory and, you know, yeah. it's my choice. So, right. So, uh, Jared, Jared's got some questions for you. And, and well, the main thing is one of the recent posts that you put up and he wanted to, to ask you about that and have you elaborate on it. Yeah. I was scrolling through the Instagram and I saw a, a really cool picture of, um, of his great grandfather holding a picture of his dad, holding a picture of him and then holding a picture of his son. So there's, four generations of the Reamer family right there. And I thought that was a fascinating picture and it was uh, enough to stop my scroll and make me actually read the description and the description, what was the most powerful out of the whole thing. Uh, so I just want you to tell that story about your grandfather being hit in the ditch and, and then, you know, fast forward to 45 years later where your father was actually able to recover the body. Uh, yeah. So, my grandfather, so my great grandfather, uh, who I did not get a chance to ever meet, he died during the w war. He was a livestock farmer uh, back in a place called Kolome, and it was on the like Russia Ukrainian slash Polish borders, like all wrapped in one, depending on you know the moment in history. Uh, and a poor farmer came to my grand, great grandfather and said, Hey, listen, I have bought so many live, you know, not ca cows and stuff to work the fields. And every time I buy one, it dies. And then he didn't buy it from my grand, my great grandfather. He just bought them from around dies. He goes, do you have anything, even a horse? And my great grandfather said, like, yeah, I actually have a horse that I can sell you. Uh, and the farmer's like, unfortunately, I just don't have the money. So my great grandfather basically said, hey, don't worry about it. One day you'll pay me back. Uh, World War II starts, Nazis are moving in, and around that area, it was getting really bad. And my great-grandfather with my great-grandmother, my grandfather, and my great-uncle um, went to the farmer and said, you need to hide us. Uh, we're, we can't get out. Uh, you know, Poland, this area has been surrounded, and we, we need your help. And the farmer, without hesitating said absolutely, especially because the horse that my grandfather gave him literally was a workhorse. I mean, changed everything for the farmer, saved hit the farmer's life and his family because they were now able to work the land and produce food. So on the land, there was this big farm, uh, I'm sorry, a, um, a barn. And my grand and the, the farmer hid all four of them in a ditch that was smaller than most people's dining room table. Uh, we're talking about maybe like eight, I don't know, six feet across by like four feet wide, like really small. And you had two adults and two children in there. Uh, my grandfather was, I think like 14 at the time. Uh, and from there, the farmer put them in there, put a gigantic pile of hay and locked them up there. Uh, and they were there for 19 months living in this ditch. They were only allowed out for one hour every night, as long as the coast was clear, just to stretch their legs. And yeah, they were there for 19 months. My grandfather tells me the story how when he was finally liberated from that area, he took his shirt off and it basically crawled away. There was so many lice and bugs living on it. His skin was so damaged from 
you know, never being able to bathe or things like that. But in, in, during those 19 months, my great grandfather, uh, unfortunately, uh, died, wasn't killed, just malnutrition and, and I mean, literally living in a ditch. So he passed away. And one night, my, my grandfather, who again was 14, I think, I think 14 at the time, maybe 13, something like that, him and the farmer's son went in the middle of the night to bury my great, my great grandfather. Now, what's interesting is the farmer had just planted on his property, three trees, um, you know, weren't big, but my great, my, my grandfather has always had this weird sort of, I don't know, call it a, a, I don't, maybe it was a peripheral issue. I don't know. But if you had three things, one, two, three, or if you put up three pictures on the wall, he was never able to line them up straight. Never, um, what's it called? The centered them. Everything was center right. So middle of the night, they dug a ditch, threw, threw the body in, covered it up, and that was it. And they literally threw the body in. My my great grandmother, my grandfather, and my great uncle all survived the war. Eventually, making their way to America. Uh, funny story about their trip to America when they got to New York. The customs agents like, okay, where do you want to live? And they're like, New York, because that's really the only place they knew. This was 1946. And the customs agent said, "I'm sorry, New York is all full. You you, you need to pick somewhere else, and you need it's to either full. pick." Well, I mean, if you think about it, right, you had uh, oh, yeah. th- thousands of hundreds of thousands of refugees coming over since the war ended. So he's like, yeah, we, we just we can't house you here. So my grandfather is like, oh, so where can we go? And he's like, well, you can either move to Los Angeles or Dallas. And my grandfather turns to my great grandmother and says, we need to move to Los Angeles. And she's like, why? And he he explained to my great grandmother. I mean, she knew, she knew, but she he explained that the word "dalas" in Yiddish means poor. So why would uh, we want to? Why would we want to move to where poor people are? He figured people in Dallas were all poor, and that was why the city was named that. So <laughs> they cho- they chose Los Angeles. Funny thing is. I now live in Dallas, right? Like years later, <laughs> my wife and I, my wife and I moved from Los Angeles to Dallas just because it's much easier to do what I do. Um, when I'm like, oh look, there is something that's highly illegal in California, but totally legal in Texas. Uh, definitely helps with me being who I am no, in the know. And so they moved to Dallas. They moved to Los Angeles, and in 1991, I don't even remember. I've read the article a million times, but I just don't remember the years. Uh, in 1991, my father, and, and there's a lot more to the story than than you know what I'm going to tell you because this is this is like a this is like a series would have to be a series to get into the nitty gritty. But in 1991, my grandfather, I'm sorry, my father flew to Europe. And I mean, it, it was a crazy story, you know, getting stopped at the Russian border, bribing the guards with cigarettes, like American cigarettes. And like, it was a whole thing. And my father made his way to the farm that saved my family. And they knew my father was coming and he got, he gets to the farm and it's again, it's been 45 years and they want to excavate the body and bring the body to Israel to bury the body in Israel. So how do you find a body that's 40, you know, that's been in the ground for 45 years without a, without a, a marker or a gravestone or anything. So my grandfather told my father, I buried the body next to three trees, right? Those three trees that the farmer had just planted. So on the property, my father found the three trees and he's like, where do we start? And he's like, you know what? We're going to start 
center right because my grandfather was crazy, right? Like everything, nothing could be centered. Within a few hours, they found the first bone. And finally, they found every bone except from the knees down. The legs were completely missing. And they were like, they're like, oh my God, like what the hell, right? Like it's been 45 years. No one's touched this area. How come the legs are missing? And then my father realized that when my grandfather buried his father, they didn't have time to dig six feet down and, and, and laid the body out. They dug literally a hole, dumped the body in. So instead of excavating this way, they had to excavate down. So my father dug, you know, a few feet down and they ended up finding the legs as well. At the end of the day, they found every single bone, including every tooth. And my father was able to bring my, my great grandfather to Israel and bury him in Israel. Yeah, that's and, a powerful story. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty crazy story. And, and I've thought long, so many times, like I want to put this into a book. Um, but I, I, my hands are so full with so many things right now. Like I'm working on three new books simultaneously. And now just this morning, I thought of a new book and I'm like, immediately message my illustrator. I'm like, okay, give me a price list. I want this book done in the next year. So, you know, I'm working on so many things right now, but I need to just sit down and I write children's books and blank books. So (laughs) it's kind of, it's kind of hard for me to sit down and write an actual book that has words in it. Um, that isn't for a six year old. So I, I, I need to, I need to, I need to kind of find, um, a good ghostwriter who I can lay out, you know, the, the form, the story and have them write it. Yeah. Do you ever find that if, if you don't have a book in the works that it feels wrong to you? Yes and no. Cause I feel it's not that it feels wrong. It kind of feels more along the lines of have I peaked, right? Like, I have eight books out, right? And my from my first book, which is a book about gun safety for children, which thankfully is still doing well, to my last book, and it's been about a, almost two years since my last book came out, right? My my bullet points book, which is still pissing all the right people off. <laughs> um, that book, you know, it, it's been two years, but I've had like I have one manuscript completely done. Um, I just I need to find someone who will sponsor it. Uh, you know, I need about five thousand dollars to get it sponsored. Um, not super easy. You know, there's not a lot of people who are like, "Oh, we'll give you five grand." Um, my next book that I thought of this morning, five grand that I need. That one might be a little easier because it's going to be. If you would see this book that I have in mind, and you wouldn't know who made it, you would look at it and be like, "Oh, had to be Yehuda, absolutely." Like no one else would think of a book like that. So um, that book might be easier to find. But, but to answer your question, it, it, it kind of, if I'm not having something in the works, it kind of feels like I peak. And I'm like, oh, shoot, what am I going to, that's it. I'm, you know, eight books in. But, you know, my, my dream is to, I would, I would love to hit 10 books in my life. If I can say, you know, at my deathbed that, hey, I've published 10 books, that's a pretty cool feeling. So, it's definitely doable because I'm only 39 and I already have eight, but yeah, oh, um, definitely for sure. Yeah. yeah you'll get way. Uh, and that. you already have the concept for two more. So yeah. 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 So it's, it's fun. It, it's fun. I love it. I'm going to keep on doing it until they shut me down or I'm just like, okay, I'm done worrying about getting more books out, that kind of thing. Yeah. The, uh, I think dad, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he's got like 31 published titles now or 32. Uh, it's over 40 over 40 now holy cow oh, yeah that's crazy i don't he, the, he's a writing fool i don't understand how he does it i don't have any books published under my name yet so um no i have i get this feeling like, like uh, and it's funny because 10 12 years ago um when i wrote the 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 student of the gun book and someone said well they asked me in an interview they're like well what's the next book and i, I was like uh i don't know uh, I haven't thought about it yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but now 
I actually, I published my first book, what was it, 97, Jared? I think it was 97. Um, and then I went several years. But but now the, the process, yeah, it's, it's funny how your brain changes and how things change. And uh, I'm at the point now where if I don't have a book in the works, like if it's one's just, they're just done, and there's, there's, there's not an open document that is a new book, I feel like I should. Like, I feel like I should be doing it. Uh, and so I started another one the other day. But, <laughs> so, so, and it, well, I started another one. It, it's, it's almost done. But uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's funny how, you're, how things change. And you know, you people, when I started writing magazine articles way back when, we used to kill trees and, and sprinkle ink on them and staple them and sell them to people. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, you know, selling your first article is amazing. You know, the first time you, you someone gives you a check for an article, you're like, wow. Uh, and, and it seems like it's, it's like an almost an unattainable dream. And then and then later on, you realize like, oh, one one isn't really that hard because everybody out there, even, you know, if you're listening to me right now on the treadmill or in your car or wherever you are, everybody has one story, right? Generally, everybody has one story worth telling. Uh but the trick is to be a writer. You know, what, what did Billy Crystal say in Throw Mama from the Train? He would close every, every class with, remember, a writer writes. Uh, and the trick is not the one. The trick is the, is the two and the three and the four and, and so on and so forth. How do you continue to be productive? Uh, and that's the hard thing. But we talked about all of that. And people who are, who are new, you're like, okay, that's great. We, you got this special guest, and he tells a personal story about his family. What the heck does that have to do with student of the gun? Yehuda, what does that have to do with, with student of the gun or guns or firearms? or you know, it's, it, it's a nice family story, but. Because it's, it spurred me to become the Pew Pew Jew. And like my best-selling shirt says, people with ARs don't get in cattle cars. So, um, you know, it's, it's definitely lit a fire under me to become a second amendment activist, to be out there fighting for our second amendment rights, um, for everybody. I uh, don't care who you are. Uh, everyone has a right to the self-defense. So it's just kind of built. And the funny thing is it's never like the story about my family never really inspired me to get into guns what what got me into guns was just i really enjoyed action movies growing up and then my buddy took me shooting and I, you know i was a spoiled little los angeles boy and i and i'll admit that and i never cared about the constitution or politics or this you know the state of the union or anything like that and finally when obama started running in 2008 i kind of started paying attention and i realized i'm like whoa here I thought all Jews were Democrats. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not a Democrat. Hell, I'm not even a Republican. I'm like a three percent Tea Party patriot, you know, hoorah, mother effer. You know, like I'm like all. Oh, you're an extremist. Yeah, I'm an extremist. <laughs> and um, and then from there, I kind of you know bought my first gun. I was again living in Los Angeles. Bought my first gun. My parents found out, freaked out, even though I was married and out of the house. Um, and from there, I was like, you know what? If I'm gonna if I'm going to be a gun owner, I need to be a responsible gun owner. And that means I need to make sure my kids are safe. That kind of led me to write my first book because there was nothing like my book on the market. And then when I was writing my book, 27 words, which is a, an introduction, well, not an intro, it's more of a, a breakdown of the 27 words of the second amendment for children. I was writing that and I was talking to a second amendment historian and he's like, you know, you're kind of like the pew pew Jew. And, you know, from there, it just looks like, all right, full throttle with the pew pew Jew. Let's get a <laughs> logo. Let's, let's just work hard in getting that up and running. And one thing led to another. And, and you know, my first book, I, I, hell, I didn't even think I'd ever be published ever. Like no one ever thinks they're actually going to be published. Especially I had horrible, horrible self-esteem growing up, like horrible self-esteem. So I was like, yeah, you know, I'm just a loser. I'll never amount to that much. I'll, you know, I'll get married, have kids, be a, you know, accountant or some 
freaking Jewish job that we all have and, <laughs> Jewish, and account. uh, <laughs> Jewish account, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I, that's what I thought, honestly, that's what I thought until like all of a sudden my book was published after five and a half years of trying to get my first book published. And the next thing I know, you know, I have people like Alan Gottlieb and, and, uh, God, I don't even like it. Just, uh, Masada you all, you know, giving me endorsements and saying, Oh, this book is fantastic. It needs to be in every children's, you know, every, every household in the country. And, and I'm like, Whoa, Whoa, Hey, Ho, Ho, you know, slow down there. I'm a nobody like stop, stop building up something that will come crashing down. Um, or getting my hopes up if you will. And all of a sudden I'm like, wow, I have one book published. Let's write more. And I released four books. In so, one which year. title was your first? Was it Safety On or the ABCs? Yeah. Safety On was my first. Safety On, the coloring book okay. version, was my second. Then I believe was the ABCs of Guns, twenty-seven words. No, I'm sorry. Let me backtrack. It was Safety On, Safety On coloring book. ABCs of guns. Then came 10 little liberals. Then came, mm -hmm. then came 27 words. Then 10 little gun grabbers. Nope. Sorry. Back one more. 105 explosive gun jokes. <laughs> 105 explosive gun jokes. Then came 10 little gun grabbers and then came bullet points. All right. It's pretty funny. You went from not thinking you were going to have one book published to really having a trouble remembering which order they came in. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, it, it's crazy. And, and, you know, my, my entire brand is based on, you know, I, I like to say think grunt style for Jews, uh, you know, if, if you will. Um, and, you know, I have just a lot of self deprecating stuff. Everything is Jewish and, and pro gun. Um, but you know, like I said, I have a lot of non-Jews buy my stuff. Like this shirt right here is great because I have so many people reaching out to me. They're like, Hey, we're not Jewish, but is it okay if we, you know, is it appropriate for us to buy that shirt and wear it? I'm like, it's anti-Semitic. Oh, I'm like, it's anti-Semitic if you don't buy it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so like, are, we are we are we allowed? Yeah. You're, you're yeah. No, I, I get that all the time. I get that all the time. Are we allowed to buy your stuff if we're not Jewish? I'm like, Yes. Oh, yes, thank you, please. Buddy. Thanks. I, yeah, I, 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 see, you're nicer than me. I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> That's no. funny. So, no, what do you think? The, why do you think that a lot of Jews nowadays are aligned with the Democrat Party and the Democrat values when clearly they're taking us on a path that is similar to what led to the slavery? Nazis? Well, that's a. I mean, that's again, you know, a whole. Uh, series of podcasts in itself but in short you got to you kind of have to go back into history where you you have jews in europe you know you have the pogroms and you have murders and rapes and stuff like that and if the jews would retaliate if they would kill a cossack for example the cossacks would come and kill 100 jews for one cossack killed right so jews in europe just kept tried to keep their head down and whatever happened happened right it, it, it is this is just what god wants just that's it. Flash forward to, you know, the uh, 1920s and you have, you know, the, the, the deal, what's that, the, the new deal and the second new deal or whatever it was called from FDR. Um, and then not that was it FDR. I don't Honestly, I'm so tired. Um, mm -hmm. but you get, you get my point. You have, you know, all these social programs, then you right. have the Holocaust, you have the Holocaust and, that hundreds of thousands of surviving Jews made their way to America after the Holocaust. But they came with nothing, literally nothing, not a penny in their pocket, and whatever clothes were on them, that was it. They get to America, they find a place to live, and they're like, well, how do we survive? But you have all of these social programs in place that can help them. So which, which uh, political party was the one that brought that on? It was the Democratic Party. So you have all these Jews now becoming, and again, this is just a, a massive nutshell of an answer, right? Like there's, there's a lot more to it. I don't want people to think like, oh, it's that, it was it that simple. It wasn't that simple, but this is just to save time. 
Um, and now you have a bunch of Jews in America who are completely devoted to a party that is continuously giving them things to help them. And, you know, the 40s happens, the 50s happens, then you have the 60s, and Jews are still Democrats because, hey, my father was, you know, my father came and the Democratic Party helped him, so we're Democrats. And one thing led to another, and Jews have just remained Democrats, uh, very pro-Democrats. Now, a lot of a lot of Orthodox Judaism tends to be more Republican and right-wing because they are, you know, a lot more right, uh, you know, right to, um, right to life, pro-life, uh, and they, it, the public party tends to be more of the religious party, right? More of the Judeo-Christian value party. So a lot of Orthodox Jews tend to swing right. But that's really the nutshell of an answer why so many Jews still, uh, rely on the democratic party but keep in mind also a lot of jews nowadays are what i call ginos right they're jews in name only mm. right they they worship the liberal party to them it's liberalism over judaism so judaism comes a very distant second Oh, that's 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 very yeah. common. Not just with that's it's not just with 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 Jews or, or uh, it's with everything. It's like how Liberals how does a how does a a woman who claims to be a feminist support the Democrat Party, which is overpopulated with rapists and, and people who treat you know how did how did women support Bill Clinton, a serial yeah. rapist, right? Uh, how did and, and it, you could just name the the group because it's always it's always liberalism over everything else. It's liberal first, feminist second. It's liberal first, Jew second. It's you know whatever uh, it happens to be. It's the same thing with Christians. You have people who com- who portend to be faithful Christians and and vote for Democrats. Uh, the cognitive dissonance there is is staggering. It's staggering, uh, but that's that is the lie of li- well. Michael Savage said it best: liberalism is a mental disorder. Yeah, uh, it, it literally it's it's a mental disorder uh, that people embrace, and they and because that's the the default is to allow somebody else. You know, there's the diff- you know the difference between and and I really I really get sick of the whole liberal conservative thing. But but the fact is, we have to have some type of labels to describe things, but. Right. To, when you have somebody who says, oh, I am a fill in the blank, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a Jew, whatever. And you're like, yeah, but this group that you're associating yourself with is they're contrary to everything you claim is your values. You know, it's like sportsmen for Biden, you know, <laughs> they, when they, you know, they came up with this. They did. The, they started that crap with Clinton sportsman for clinton and then they moved it to sportsman for obama and then right. like sportsman for biden i'm like first of all that's not a thing that's yeah. like that's like jews for hitler you know <laughs> that, that that'd be like the rabbi saying you know this hitler guy's got some good ideas you know he's into kindergarten and stuff he wants everyone to have a car he's going to build good roads and we're going to be able to drive super fast on them what's your problem Trains yeah. will be on time yeah. and everything. Yeah, people. <laughs> nice. trains, yeah, that was. Yeah, that that was. Uh, that <laughs> Hold was on, Mussolini. Mussolini. <laughs> Hold on, then. Mussolini. Uh, yeah. Jared, so, I'm, what? Jared, what I, I'm I'm texting you right now. I came up. It's not for public, but I'm texting you right now. Okay. This is a sure way that if anyone comes at you with any Nazi jokes, Holocaust jokes, or any kind of anti-Semitic thing. Um, this is a sure way to shut them down because they will have no response. Huh, I came yeah, up with funny. that. Yeah, that's funny. Right? Like, yeah, I think, yeah, short, short-lived movements. Like, like yeah. you know, sportsman for Biden. <laughs> yeah, sportsman for Obama. Sure, sure. Okay. So I need to take All a hard right. left turn and go back. Take a hard the, left. The, hard, uh, hard right. The family story that you know, shared earlier. Did you ever get to talk to your grandfather about what the will to live was why did they stay in the ditch for so long no he he tried not to talk about it um every now and then you would get snippets of it but he wasn't um 
he was very anti living in the past. And what I mean by that is I have three older cousins and I have an older brother. And a lot of times after an Orthodox Jewish boy or girl graduate from high school, they go to Israel for the year, right? To a yeshiva or like a girl's seminary type of thing. Yeah. And when you're in Israel, there's a lot of organizations that will take you on these Holocaust oriented trips to Poland, Ukraine, Prague, Germany, all these places. So all my cousins want to go. And my brother want to go. And my, every time they would mention it, but you know, they, my grandfather in his like deep, deep European accent would go, if you go back to Europe, I will drop dead. Right. Like, like, like that's it. Right. And they're like, well, great. Now he's going to die if we go. So like, no, no one ever went. When I was in Israel for my year, I basically called my parents. I told them I'm going. And if they tell my grandfather, I will disappear in Israel and they'll never find me again. <laughs> like, I'm like, like I'm, I'll, I'll literally run away. And my parents were like, okay, fine. Um, even though they were kind of against it, but they were like, okay, fine. When years later, we're talking about 10 years later, um, we were all my cousins. We were all by my grandfather's apartment. We're all hanging out. And I don't remember how it happened, but someone kind of let slip that I've gone to Europe, uh, to Poland, Prague, and Ukraine. And my grandfather, so my full name is Gershon Yehuda. My first name is Gershon. So my grandfather, that's what that I'm named after my great grandfather who passed away in that ditch. So my, my grandfather was like, Gershon, you went to Poland and Ukraine and saw what the Nazis did. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to own it. Right. I'm like, yes, yes. Grandpa, I did. He goes, I'm so, so proud of you. (laughs) 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 And my, my cousins and my older brother were all like, what the, f-? like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? And, and I'm just sitting there, you know, feeling like a million bucks. And, um, and uh. he, starts a- he starts asking me about it. But only a few years later, he started coming down with um, dementia. So we, we never really got to talk to him. But what was crazy, though, is my other grandfather, my mother's father, his story of survival is ridiculous. I mean, we're talking about he was in 11 different camps at age 14. He was pulling gold teeth out of bodies in Auschwitz. And his story is crazy. But when he made his way to America after the war, he never talked about his time. Um, he saw, his, you know, his father was killed in Auschwitz. He was liberated by the Americans, so felt a immense gratitude to the point where joined the air force and worked on like some top secret radar MIG thing in like the late fifties during the Korean war. Um, and we first kept from him that I had gone to Europe. We just didn't want to upset him, but eventually, um, my grandfather was an amazing photographer and I get a lot of my photography genes from him. Uh, we're talking about, he had like a Leica M3 that's in pristine condition, uh, which, which I actually have up now. And if oh, I wanted cool. to, yeah, I mean, we're talking about like original lenses, not a dent, no not way. A scratch, um, original Leica case, like this from 1954, this camera to the point where if I approach like a Japanese collector, I probably can get 30, 40, 50 grand for it. Yeah. Like that, it has a, a light meter. I mean, we're talking about all of it. So um, my my grandfather saw, I, when I went to Europe my first time, I took pictures for myself of Poland and Ukraine. And the head of the organization that I went on saw my photos. And my second year in Israel invited me to become the official photographer for the trip. So That's I cool. made this, yeah, it was very cool. I was like 18, 19. It was like my first real job. I was like, why is he asking me? I don't know what the hell I'm doing with the camera. I'm still shooting on automatic. Like I didn't know how to use the manual mode. And, um, but at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, my grandfather saw this book of pictures that I made and he's looking through the book and like my grandmother and my mom 
my dads are like freaking out. They're like, he's going to just go ballistic. And all of a sudden, like tears start rolling down his eyes again, because my, my other grandfather was hid by farmers. You can't really say he was part of the actual Holocaust, right? He never was in the concentration camp. And I mean, again, he was part of the whole Nazi persecution, but he was never in a hall. He was never in a concentration camp or never really was in that scenario where my other grandfather was actually in, uh, I mean, he went to 11 different camps, including Auschwitz. He had the numbers tattooed on his arm. Um, so he had all this stuff. So he's all of a sudden he's looking through this book and he just sees tears. And he's like, you know, you to come here. And I sat down next to him and he's like, did you go to Europe and take these photos? I'm like, I'm like, yeah, grandpa, I did. You know, I felt it was very important for me to go see what happened to you and document what I saw from my own eyes, not through history's eyes, but from my own eyes. And he closes the book. And like my, I said, my, like my parents and my grandmother are standing like five feet behind him. And he just starts a lot of information. We're talking about like, like I said, pulling, like he was 14, pulling gold teeth from dead bodies and, and telling me stories about what happened. And, and all of a sudden, like my, I hear everyone like bawling in the background, but like, they don't yeah. want to, they don't want to say anything because they want him to keep talking. And after he was done, he kind of just quietly went upstairs and kind of disappeared for the rest of the day. But my grandmother came up to me and gave me a huge hug and kiss and said, I've been married to him for 55 years and I have never heard one of those stories. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. So, you know, that definitely, you know, back to bringing it to guns, you know, I, I have a, and it's a very weird thing to say, I have a very rich history, uh, Holocaust history, part, that's part of my family. Um, and that definitely has helped me become who I am today. I am vehemently pro-gun. Uh, I, I will not, I mean, 2A absolutist. Um, I mean, to the point where I, in my safe upstairs, I even have a Walther P-38 with Nazi insignia still stamped on the gun that I, I was able to get my hands on. Oh, that's a cool piece of history. It's a great piece of history. And, and you know, I bought it for two reasons. Oh, world, I used to work at a gun store and the World War II veteran came in and my boss bought it and I just turned to the boss like, I want it. And I, I, he gave it to me for an, an insane deal. I mean, I think it was like 375 he gave it to me for because he knew. Wow. Or maybe it was 400 because he knew. Either way, yeah. Yeah, he, he knew that the reason why I wanted it. And he was like, yeah, I can probably make, you know, he, I think he bought it off the guy for like 300. But like he knew like is the $700 that he might make worth the reasons why I want it. Yeah. And now my kids have seen it. Uh, you know, I bought it for two reasons. A, there's no bigger F you to Hitler. <laughs> it's like, right. Like literally no bigger F you to Hitler, but also I, I, as that, that's the Jewish aspect, but as the second amendment activist aspect, I want my kids to understand that even though the Eagle and swastika are stamped on the side of this gun, that, a gun is a tool and in the hands of the Nazis, it was used for evil. But in my safe, if I ever take it out in our hands, it will never be used for evil. In other words, a gun is a tool, nothing yeah. more. And it's a very good history lesson for my children to help them understand the importance of the second amendment. Yeah, that's a fantastic lesson. How old are your kids? My oldest is 13, then I have an 11-year-old, a 7-year-old, and then um, Satan Reborn is 21 months. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, he, my, my, my baby, um, if he was my first, my wife and I would have been one and done. <laughs> he, he is, my, my older three were near perfect children. I mean, never had an issue. They, they were just... I mean, hey, we want like we want to take a nap. So like go upstairs. They would go into their beds and take a nap without like telling her. Like just the perfect children. Never complain, never whine. But then this last one is 
like, uh, like I guess I'm, he's like Satan reborn. I don't I like, like when, when he starts really bothering me, I yell at him that I'm going to use the two year return policy on him. But, uh, <laughs> Put that thing back where it came from. Yeah, but I love him. He's, he is chubby and cute and he is just one of the funniest kids I have ever dealt with. Not just my kids, from my my nieces and nephews, and he is just mischievous to everything, and I I love it. So it's just a pain. It'll be good for you. Yeah, I've read oh, a lot absolutely. of these, uh, a lot of stories. I have a few books back here that are written by kids that are that were they were written as an adult, but they were kids that went through the Holocaust and went through several different camps and whatnot. So reading those books, I've always wondered. Well, it's made me realize that the the human like desire for survival is extremely powerful. But also, I've always wondered what is the will to survive for people that are going through something like that. Is it their family? Is it because they want to to take an ice pick and, and like say "f you"? I made it through this to the people that did it to them. I don't. I don't know what. The- I mean, it, I, I guess everyone has their own reasons. Um, what I would say is. If you read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, yeah, um, right, and he talks about his idea, which he created called logotherapy. And the notion is if you can find one thing, no matter how small it is, that is worth living, you can overcome absolutely anything. And again, it can be, uh, for everyone, it's different. But, you know, if if your, you know, if your your drive for living is so that you can buy that freaking Ferrari that you saved up for, now you and I might be said, you know what, screw it, we'll die over that. You know, we don't care. But for someone to, who that, if that means enough to them, that their their will for survival and for living is that strong that they want to buy something like that, they'll be able to do it. And I read that book when I was in Israel, and man. Man's Search for Meaning is absolutely a life-changing book. And if you haven't read it, I cannot recommend it enough. You know, I suppose this is something that I could ask dad because he's been in situations multiple times in his life where he had to to find the goal to survive the situation. And if that's something you don't want to talk about on the radio, then that's fine. But um, if you do, then that would be awesome. Oh, yeah, this may throw the sand grenade at you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I pulled the pin and I threw the grenade to you. Here you go. Here you go. Catch. Uh, no, I can't. I, the main, the, well, the thing that uh, helped me, like, 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 uh, first time I was in combat was, and, and I talked to a lot of combat veterans after this, and they said that the thing that they did was they cleared the deck mentally, they, they removed, Everything that was superfluous, everything that didn't, that wasn't necessarily required for to do the job, uh, and they they just pushed that away and focused. Uh, and, and I, I know I, I I have not read Man's Search for Meaning, but I can tell you this: that it, it's that mental focus and it's the ability to focus and have the clarity uh, that is absolutely needed. And we, I think, a lot of people in our world today have a hard time because there's so much clutter and there's so much distraction. And we, we really do our children a disservice by allowing them to, to fall into this, this web of clutter and distraction and in essentially meaningless nonsense where, and we don't give them that say that solid foundation, or we should give them that solid foundation. We're like, look, everything else aside, everything else is it's, it's nonsense. Or like, uh, what did Solomon say? It's chasing after wind because, you know, in, in the, was it Ecclesiastes? In Ecclesiastes, Solomon talks about it's all, it's all wind. It's all chasing wind. Uh, and, and that's what we do uh, as humans. We, we have a lot of, we spend a lot of our time chasing wind and, and at the you know at the end of the day, you know who gives a crap about what's going on on socialist media or, or the Kardashians or whatever nonsense? It's just distraction. It's garbage, and we have to to pull back and and find out what is really important, and what's really valuable in our lives. And when it come and let just to 
take it all the way back to firearms is, you know, people with, there have been numerous genocides throughout the history of the world. Uh, there's the Armenian genocide, you know, there's the, the Jewish genocide, there's the, the you know, African, most recently, uh, genocides in Africa, genocide in Cambodia, genocide in China. Uh, one of the, all of those things have one thing in common. None of the people who were genocided were armed. That none, 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 all these, these tens of hundreds of millions of people who were genocided, if that's a, if that's a verb, if we can use that as a verb, genocided, were part of an armed society, an armed culture, a culture where the people could possess arms. And, you know, the, the, the Democrats and the socialists and the communists and the people who want to control us, they just skip over that part and they want to talk about other things. And, but that's, you know, when, when it comes to control, when it comes to gun control, you have to ask yourself, and if people, you know, what if people in 1935 or uh, in Cambodia or in Rwanda or in Armenia or wherever, fill in the blank, if they would have all stood up and said, what is it about their agenda that requires us to be disarmed? What, what is it? What is it about this Hitler guy's agenda that requires us to be disarmed? What is it about Pol Pot's agenda that requires us to be disarmed? What, you know, Mao, fill in the blank. But we're there, and we're able to do that. And we can say, what is it about their agenda that requires us to be disarmed? And you can answer that question for yourself. But the fact of the matter is, no, no group... Uh, of people, no society, no culture has been genocided and been armed at the same time. And whether, you know, the, the, the these imbeciles are like, I, I, I like that uh, somebody, some, uh, you know what an RIA is, right, Yehuda? An RIA? Rock Island Armory? No, a, <laughs> a random, a random internet a-hole. Some, that, that's a, never heard that before. That's yeah, funny. so some some RIA jumped into our feed the other day, and, and, he, and he's like, "Ah, if you think," and he, he spouted the he had the he had the talking points from the from the liberal left from the CNN. If if you think that that you can take on the army, you've got another thing coming. You're a fool or whatever. It's like, ha! And, and I put laughs in Afghani slash laughs in Vietnamese. Like, <laughs> Really? <laughs> really, homeboy? That was probably too uh, smart for him. Yeah, laughing in Afghani, laughing in Vietnamese. Like, that's exactly what they did. We had peasant farmers with, with rifles that took on the most powerful army in, in the world. Plus, what, what, And won. Yeah, kind of what you just said, which is the thing that they don't want to say out loud when they're talking about the stuff. It's like, oh, you, you think you can take on the army? It's like, no, but me and a couple hundred other people like me can. It's like they, they, we, they, they want to, we imp- can, they, they want to imply that you're alone, that it will be you against the entire Marine Corps. That's what they want to imply and make you think. All right, can, can we just take a quick break and say that that just freaked I like, I just got totally like what, where my brain went, like all of a sudden someone's talking, but no one's lips are moving. <laughs> and, Sorry about that, and, producer. Here. And no, no, to- totally. I mean, there's a, literally a green box around you when you talk, and I guess it's been you've been so quiet the whole time that all of a sudden I'm like, like I can't. I, oh my god, yeah, whatever. I, I just, like, <laughs> that was a total <laughs> mind bend just now. He's like, yes, Lord. Yeah, <laughs> That's funny. Pretty, pretty much, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, where? I'm like, is there that big of a delay? You know, like, where is this voice coming? Yeah. I'll. Uh, I got one more thing to say, and then I'll wrap it up here. Yeah, we need to put a, I, a cork in this bottle. I had an epiphany the other day. Uh, if you've read Plato's Republic, you know that they he had what he considered the five regimes. It was aristocracy, democracy, oligarchy, which degraded into democracy, which then degraded into tyranny, and he. They they presume that that's just the cycle of governments, and so it was kind of uh, disheartening for me because we're you know if that is the case then we're headed to tyranny. However, I realized that we're not a democracy. I mean, I realized that a long time ago, but I didn't apply it in this fashion. 
there is no, there was no, we are the first representative republic. So we are probably going to be able to break that cycle, right? If we have the, the, the people that are willing to have the knowledge and that are willing to make that cycle break, then I think that we can do that. So, well, um, Rome was a republic, but what didn't they have? Yeah, they didn't. Ha- they didn't acknowledge that there there were inherent rights for the humans. Yeah, Rome was a republic, but they didn't have a bill of rights. Yeah, you know, everybody in the world, every, you know, freaking North Korea has a constitution. Um, yeah. But what does that mean? It means it means nothing without without rights, without God given rights, without rights that are affirmed uh, by your Creator. Everything else is just is just a privilege from a dictator. Uh, how does that, that, that dictate? Yeah, that's, that's why we're different. That's that's why we have the potential to be different. And that's why we that's why they hate us so much. That's why the the world's dictators and the, and the world's tyrants they just hate us. Because we're the bad example that for their people. We're that example that, you know, they're over there doing their thing and they're going to make our people think that they should be free too. So they got to do everything they can to silence us and destroy us, and, and we're doing it from within. But uh, Pew Pew, Yehuda, um, thank you very much for joining us today. I, I'm sh- I hope everyone appreciated it. If you don't, well, then just tough nuggies. Go somewhere else and uh, listen get to something taste. else. Get better taste. Yeah. That's right. Go get well, better taste and problem. come back. Where can people go to find the shirts and whatnot and all your books? Um, if you want, uh, I'm across social media at the pew pew jew and then the pew pew jew.com you can get signed copies of my books t-shirts camo yarmulkes i mean you name it so a lot of fun stuff at my site are are are, uh gentiles allowed to buy your stuff they absolutely are uh it would be it would be anti-semitic if you don't buy it (laughs) (laughs) are you all out of the uh the ar the the box cars no, that's, that's, I, those are, right now, everything with the AR box car, the, the cattle car shirts, mm-hmm. flags, all that, that's all print on demand. So as oh, long okay. as, but I am, I am in the middle of having those made into patches. So awesome. Uh, patches will be, will be, uh, you know, soon. There you go. All right. Yeah. We got to, so go to the, go to the pew, pew, com. And you can get a kosher shirt, or you can get the uh, the the boxcar shirt, or whatever you want to get. There's Just, one that says "I trigger hoplophobes." That's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe no one has come up with that yet. I was so proud of myself. Like I scoured the internet for a shirt like that. I'm like, how has no one come up with "I trigger hoplophobes"? That's pretty funny. So yeah, it's definitely funny when you walk through the mall. And it's, people, it's like way up here. It's like, it's so far up. They're like, yeah, they, they think like, all like, like, oh, so you hate gay people. I'm like, no, no like, oh, like, so, like, 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 yeah, that's it. it. Yeah, you're, that, that's yeah, it. yeah. You, you, you're, you're the you smartest. Me. You, you figured it out. Congratulations. Yeah, no, that, that shirt, um, <laughs> like you actually have to, it's so simple, but like you actually have to get the play on words. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of that one. That's good. So go get that How one. How dare you make people Jews. think. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you very much, Yuda, for joining us. And uh, we're, we're, we can, I guess we're at the end, aren't we, Zach? Yep. We could close it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. And we are on the floor of the NRA annual meeting 2023 in Indianapolis, Indiana. Yes, indeed. And I will not comment about Indianapolis. I will save comment. Uh, from my right, your left, we have Rachel. It's Mal- Maloney. I almost said Mahoney. A little bit of police uh, <laughs> uh, police academy action there. Mahoney. Uh, Rachel Maloney from Night Fission with an F. That's Night Fission out of Dearborn, Michigan. Correct. All right. We've got Adam Ranola from Century Arms. You know him. I'm not going to talk about him. You already know him. He's already been out here. And uh, we have Diana Mueller, uh, who is sponsored by Fiocchi, but is representing... D- uh, we're going to talk about the DC Project, the Women DC for Project. Run Rights. Yep. All right. So we'll get right into it. We were talking, we were doing a little bit of off air. Uh, tell us a little bit about the... Uh, let's talk about the the paid protesters. Okay. Well, we don't ha- we don't pay our protesters, so <laughs> no, no, <laughs> so we're at a disadvantage. That's, yeah, that's what's happening. So, 
No, um, the DC Project Women for Gun Rights. And mm -hmm. if you know anything about the uh, advocacy world and the influence world when it comes to political things, uh, Moms Demand Action is a Bloomberg funded group that gets funded about $60 million a year uh, to work against uh, work for gun control and, and really highlighting that female voice and moms of thinking these people that think that gun control is the answer to all of their violence problems when we know that that's a lie, it's it's a misinformation, whatever you want to call it. So the DC project, uh, you know, is total God thing because I didn't have a, a vision of where we're at today, uh, but we are definitely finding our niche is a counter visual and counter voice to the mom's demand action. We, we are the same demographic and we have a different solution and we do have solutions. Uh, we have uh, people that will, you know, people who have endured tragedy themselves. We have people that have uh, been victims and survivors. Uh, we have moms. Every, you know, the Second Amendment is for everybody, and it is, uh, it should be the glue that holds us together. And it is not a political issue; it's a constitutional issue. Um, and we have to, we have, we all of us have to start working with our friends, our families, our communities, and our legislators to get back to that point. Uh, because right now, being concealed carry, you know, all these people, let, let's say there's 10% of guns running around this building right here that were armed at least 10%. That's probably a pretty low number. Mm -hmm. But nobody, if you walk outside, nobody knows that we're really a gun, that, they ha that we have a gun <coughs> on us. Concealed carry kind of works to our disadvantage of them seeing my face and saying that, you know, hey, that's a gun owner. Maybe she's, she doesn't look like a, a devil. Uh, like they're being told on mainstream media. So um, that's why the shirt that we have a teal for two a shirt, it's, it says educate, not legislate. And it has some ARs on it. So I think that's why the, the shirt's important. The moms have a red shirt that says moms demand. They have a signature shirt that everybody wears in mass. And then we have a signature shirt that we wear in mass. And uh, just to give that counter counter visual and counter voice. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what I will say is uh, I believe that the, one of the biggest problems that we run into is our side. It always has been the side that just wants to be left alone. And their side is the side that can't leave you alone. Correct. They can't function. They can't survive. They can't move about their day just leaving other people alone. Correct. They, you, you have to. It's whether it's if you look at the various social issues, whether it's smoking or whether it's you know, fill in the blank. Uh, you have to agree with them. And if you don't, they're going to force you to agree with them. You know, the, the abortion thing or the transgender thing, which is freaking lunacy or yeah. the, yeah, or, or the mask thing. Yeah. We all saw that. It's like, well, okay. If you think wearing a mask is going to save you from the China flu, then wear your mask. No, it's not good enough. You have to be forced to do it. Or you hate kids. Yeah. Or you hate your grandparents <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, that, that, and I was you know, talking to my youngest son, and he said, well, you know, they, they, why can't they just make a, an, an, a legitimate argument? Well, they never, if, if you've been paying attention to the world, they can never make a legitimate argument. You, know, you say, you know, we want to protect the children. You know, like one, if one child's life is saved, then it's worth it. Okay, cool. So that you are against abortion. I'm like, I never said that. It's like, well. Well, what are you killing inside that womb there? It's not a puppy. So, yeah, if, if they if we used a gun to do that, would you oppose it then? <clears throat> yeah, but, it's like we should, you know, just add abortion clinics. So you start using AR 15s, and, and they're like, oh, what are we going to do here? Well, but, well, one of the things that, sorry to, but, but no, go ahead. Uh, one of the things that I keep telling everybody is that, you know, we have to educate ourselves on there, there's a choir that doesn't know the words to the song. You know, we're humming along, we want to sing, we want to be in the choir, but we're really not putting forth the effort to, um, learn the words of the song. So why do you oppose universal background checks? Why do you oppose red flag laws? If you can't, if you can't articulate that in 10 seconds, you've lost that influential moment with your friends, your families, and your communities. And if anybody needs help with that, go to dcproject.info. We have on our landing page a one-page free document you can download, and it, it goes over those all those hot topics. So that's, uh, and then this, this weekend on Friday, we actually did a march. We did mm -hmm. our own march um, to create that same visual like you saw in Tennessee. Uh, we did our march to the Capitol. It was only two blocks away. Um, we, we, we tried chanting. Our, ch our side doesn't chant well, but we, we gave it a good old college try. 
And we showed up with signs and, and that same kind of visual. So, and then we have a press conference and talking about why we support it uh, as our demographic, our female voice, why we support the Second Amendment and why, um, what our solutions are. Well, I think the one question that we can ask, whether it's you, me, anyone in, on our side, is what is it, and we need to ask ourselves this, is was it, what is it about their agenda that requires us to be disarmed? What is it about their agenda? China. Yeah, what is it about their <laughs> agenda that requires us to be disarmed? Because that's all that this word nonsense about it's gun control or reasonable restrictions or whatever. No, let's just call it what it is. It's civilian disarmament. So what is it about their agenda that requires us to be disarmed? Well, they don't think that they don't see that far down the field. All they know is that kids are dying. And, and I'm being told that if I take this AR-15, which kills less than hands and fists annually, um, if they if if I do this, then it'll it'll alleviate that problem. It's a lie. We oh, all yeah. know it's a lie, but they have the media, they have the Hollywood, they have everybody, all the influencers. So that's why it's important for us, we the people, to uh, be able to articulate our position. Well, what I would also say to people, whether it's you know my friends, family, or whatever, and they'd say, democracy is a lie. And, and that sounds communistic, but it's not communistic. The United States of America is not a democracy. Public. It's not a democracy because we have liberty, individual liberty. In a democracy, if 51% of the people vote to take away all of the rights of the other 49%, then the other 49% lose all their rights. And our founders knew that. They understood that. And so the answer is you really need to embrace the idea that you don't have to be liked part of the majority you don't have it, it, it doesn't matter how many they say oh and you know they lie they're like oh no, 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 no. this many people support gun control no they don't you're a liar you want to know how i know you're a liar let's look at the nicks background checks let's look at the record breaking background checks over the last five years more what that tells you is the american people want guns the american government wants them to be disarmed because if the American the American people vote with their money, okay, all these you claim all oh, the majority of Americans want reasonable restrictions on gun control. Blah, 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 blah. It's like then why are they out there buying guns in record numbers? I live in New York. Why why were all the gun stores in New York empty in 2020? Yeah, but I thought that state didn't like guns. <laughs> well, and it's going to, you know, I know you had Rebecca Schmoey on here earlier, and it's going to do, it, it takes the action of, of uh, we the people to get involved. You've seen it in the school boards. You know, COVID was kind of a blessing to, to expose what they're doing within our school systems. But when it comes to the Second Amendment, that's my lane. And I'm like, we're going to have to take control, whether it be at the school board level uh, and influencing and educating our children on how to safely and responsibly handle firearms. Or if it's at a you know, city level, a state level, we're going to have to step into that. And Rebecca did it. I'm so proud of her because she never she she doesn't have any special training. Um, I keep, I keep, you know, people keep asking me and I'm like, you, no, <laughs> I'm way too, no, can't do it. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Maybe God will put that well, on my heart if, later. If you got a, I know you got a jet and, yep. I, and of course, time. thank you. Diana. Thank you guys. Right. Thanks for letting thank you me very uh, much. Well, absolutely. kick this off. Have a good day. <clears throat> All right. Thank you to Diana Mueller from the DC project for joining us today. All right. We're going to continue. Uh, Adam, what's up, brother? Do your, do your Century handguns accept night vision sights? So actually, so Canik has, has been working for about a year now yeah. in partnership with night vision. We <laughs> so do we're a, had nothing a lot to do with our plane ride either. Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, a lot of our a lot of the uh, the night sights that are found on Canics um, and aftermarket accessories are in conjunction with some of the work that we've done with night vision. So it's been a it's, it was just kind of fortuitous that we're sitting here together at the same time. And uh, I mean, this is actually we even had some conversations accidentally on a plane one time she and i sit next to each other didn't even know who each other were and kind of you know it actually goes into what she was just talking about so for me um there's a lot of people in our industry that kind of steer clear from those kind of conversations they don't want you know somebody says on a plane what do you do uh, i'm in the sporting goods industry or you know an outdoor lifestyle kind of thing like that i straight up say out the gate i'm in the firearms industry and you know you'll get that buck sometimes people go, i'm sorry what what do you mean well what do you sell in fires oh i like shotguns I do AK-47s and, you know, and, and pistols. And why would you need that? 
And the, the biggest thing that I give is I like to have an open dialogue with people. And I say, you know, it's okay for you not to, at the end of this conversation, if you don't agree with me, that's right. And that's what's so great about this country is you're allowed to, it goes back to what you're talking about, liberty. And I know what you're, you're thinking yeah. now. No, are you actually allowed to now? No, you say you're allowed. We are allowed. You know, we say, oh, you're not allowed to agree with you. You can, you yeah. can disagree we, with me. We always the, make uh, that concession. The other side is like, no, you <laughs> have you to agree yeah. with me or I'm going to scream at you and, and call you oh, a racist. Oh, it's their way or the highway. And that's, yeah. what, that's what I go back to. And I always, and I, I love when somebody gets so passionate, and, and including if they're vehemently against me. And what I'll say is I'll just let them talk. And finally, I'll say, you know what's so, so important? And people have a really tough time arguing this. I say, you have the right to say everything you just said. I might not agree with it. I might adamantly disagree with it. Mm -hmm. But what protects your right to say everything you just said is the Second Amendment. The First Amendment, hands down, is protected. Uh, 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 it's like, in the, in, I love that. In yeah. What I would say, if, if someone says, no, that's not true. You say, that's not true. We would have a First Amendment without a second. We don't need that. Okay, cool. Go to England and offend someone on Twitter. Well, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Do you know in England, if you offend a person on Twitter, you will be arrested? That's not true. Look it up. Power of the power of the Googles. The Google internet. Yeah. It's on internet.com right there, moron. <laughs> internet because anything com. on the internet's true. No, no, it, it's true. Uh, of course, if you if you do that in Russia, they'll poison you. Well, there you go. <laughs> Uh, did you guys see that a woman was outside of a, an abortion clinic and the, the popo jacked her up in England and they questioned her and they asked her if she was praying? And she said, I am praying silently to myself. And they said, you're under arrest because it's illegal to pray in public. They, they in said England? That her, yes. Her praying, her admission that she was standing in front of an abortion clinic praying silently to herself was an admission that she was harassing the abortion clinic patrons and they arrested her there's video of it i just wow. posted it two days ago because she admitted to them that's that something she you was don't hear in it is 19 everywhere in this world it is 1994 or 1984 sorry 1984 yeah. 84, yeah. yeah it's 1984 but here big brother's watching baby but 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 we're slipping off the slope no, no, okay. it's fine, man. No, 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 no. We're going to go. on to me about <laughs> yeah. talking about clothes and socks. We can all start going down that. I, listen, like, as I mentioned before, I live in New York, right? So night fishing, we're based out of Dearborn. Um, we shared a plane ride back to JFK. I'm sure you guys were on your way south. Um, and, you know, so I live in a state that has a lot of uh, kind of attention in the media, Bloomberg based out of there, um, for not being pro 2A. Um, but however, comma, if you look at um, any of our governor races, et cetera, et cetera, the rest of the state, 93% of the land mass is the rest of the state. Mm -hmm. 60 to 70% of our population is in that 7%. So when you fly out of JFK or you fly into JFK, if you take a little picture with your phone out the window, that is where everybody makes the decision for the rest of the state, which does not look like that 7% land mass. And the rest of the state, the rest of the state is pro 2A and we're forever screaming that. And people ask us all the time because they know what I do. They know what I do for night fishing. They know what I do on the training side. And they're like, I don't understand how you're still in New York. And our answer to that, when we have our students coming through, when I'm talking about whatever concept we're talking about in a basic course or in a training course, live fire course, it's important no matter what that you show up and you go through that process, however extra layers have been thrown our way, that you show up for your two A rights in that state because that is the undeniable number to go with the pushback on that. What you just said to anybody who has quote unquote reasonable relatives or friends or family members or whatever, right? And they're like, well, you know, the electoral college is really outdated. And I read an article on the Communist News Network broadcast, whatever, about it's outdated. Like, stop. Would you agree? that Illinois, say Illinois, New York, California, whatever, you, would you agree that uh, that Cook County runs Illinois? Whoever Cook County decides is going to be the governor, that's what happens in Illinois. Same thing in New York. 
whoever Manhattan, the greater boroughs decides, that's going to be the governor. All right. Well, yeah, that's why we haven't let Coral College kids, because if it wasn't OK, if it wasn't for the Electoral College, New York City and California would choose our president every sure. single election cycle. Yeah. And it's it's infuriating for the rest of the people that are there. Um, a lot of the way that the laws are structured, it's not set up. People think that all oh, all of this layers, and again, this is people who are not delving into this who are not pro two A, but they think all of the additional stuff that's added on are somehow layers to protect people. What it does is it removes the dialogue around guns being something more conversational. A dialogue around guns, just having a normal volume conversation with someone, helping them be educated on products, helping them understand, hey, what's out there? Hey, I, I like this as a long gun. I prefer. What is this going to actually right, do? It's not a full lot of everything. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, so it's, like well, it's fully semi out of that. Exactly. You know, AK is just about as hot a word as an AR. And then, um, you know, you know, sort of professionally driving it back into to the lane uh, of, of what I do, too, as well. On top of that, where I'm like, hey, you need to upgrade some of the things that are going on on your pistol there i'm seeing that this is not going to help you be effective and employ this firearm in a safe and effective manner if god forbid you're caught in somewhere where you do need to go to gun right so we make night sites for that reason but everything around that conversation doesn't happen if someone's afraid to even offer the fact that they have a gun at that point because they're hot mm -hmm. they hide it some some people are just hiding it because they're afraid they're going to get dinged over the head the, by someone we, we, in our area like, yeah, oh we've got you have to a gun? stop apologizing you know, and we've got to go stop embracing this reasonableness disease you know my, my, believe it or not my feeling is is that if people know that i'm a gun person and they don't like that then they're not going to be my friend i don't care uh we don't need those. You don't need those people in your life. If you really believe, you know, it, I'm talking to the listeners right now. Uh, if you really believe that if your person at your church or your kid's school or your whatever yoga class found out that you're a gun owner, that they wouldn't like you anymore, wouldn't talk to you anymore or whatever. Ladies and gentlemen, join us at Look 12 there. p.m. in front of the booth 3935 for Joe Gregory's annual ring of the Freedom Bell. 12 okay. Freedom bell ring, baby. Freedom bell. We're Speaking of freedom, freedom, <laughs> freedom of speech. There freedom it is. Freedom of speech. Right there. Yes. So well, night vision. Yeah, night vision. So tell us a little bit about, right, from product standpoint, uh, you've got an excellent, a fantastic line of sites called the Accurate Sites that were developed by a professional firearms instructor with three decades of I've, experience I've in the field. I've heard of that guy, right? Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, Phil. Is it Phil? Really? Peter? He's, She's going to be doing that. Peter, yes. Peter John. Michaels. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Everybody listening to Student of the Gun knows that act about four four years ago, 2018. Sweet yeah. Buddha. Buck Henry. Yeah, yeah Buck Henry. Yeah. No, in 2018, I started working with uh, Night Vision. They approached me and they said, if you know, if you were going to design the perfect set of night sights for a Glock 19 or a Glock 17, what would you do and why would you do it? And I said, well, this is why I would do it because quite frankly, most, not all, but most original stock handgun sites, the front sight's way too low. It's too, it's too shallow. It's too, and what that does, it forces you to lift your muzzle up and people say, yeah, I like my Glock, but the farther away from the target I get, the higher the rounds hit and they, and they start going high. And I'm like, wonder why that is. It could actually be the front heights. So we worked very closely together. The, the folks at Night Vision and I, they sent me different heights of rear and different heights of front. And we, and we went back and forth, back and forth. We found the perfect solution so that uh, our Glock sights, the 19, 17, whatever, are point of aim, point of impact from five yards to 50 feet. And you say, why is that important? Because I, I was a police officer and I know police officer training and all police qualifications are between three and five yards and 50 feet or 17 yards. That's where 99% uh, of their shooting takes place. So if you can have, guarantee someone point of aim, point of impact, there's no different in the shift from there to there. You're going to, mm. that's what the, some of the other site companies out there, cops won't embrace them because they say, well, they might be good for fighting, but they're not accurate enough. You know, for me to qual and, and get experts so I can get my raise or bonus or whatever. I'm like, and with the accurate sites, like, bro, it day or night, right? They're what, called what, accuraze. What accurate. Accurate. So, yes. And the okay. tagline is absolute accuracy day or night. 
I made that up. No, I, I did make that up. Yeah? It's absolute accuracy. You get a cut of that? Are you guys night. using that? He, he does He does get a cut of he that. Yeah, he should, well, you should be using that in all of your advertising <laughs> as a absolute accuracy. You gave a set night. of those sites, Yeah, right? we gave him one. We told him one. not to mess it up. Just the front side. Just, just get, the get the one. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Just, just the front. Get what you get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for people who don't, and may, you know, I'm sure all of your listeners are, are well aware, but just for the uh, small sliver who may not know, um, our tritium is the best tritium that you can uh, bring into this country. It's Swiss tritium. Um, and so in everything that we have been doing, even though it's 2018 that we started working with you, um, the company itself has been around in its name as Night Fishing for about six or seven years now. And so for what we find, you know, at shows like this is that people are still kind of getting to know us. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is not a new game. Our sister company has been inserting tritium for 30 years. If you did a land nav course in the last 30 years, you did it with our compass. It's called the Kamenga company that we have. Um, so that L- yeah. L- uh, LH3, um, that is our company, Kamenga. Uh, excuse me, that is our NSN for the military. That is our most well-known product from Kamenga. And all of that insertion knowledge we tied into handgun sites. So nothing about the newness of the company should reflect the newness um, of what we're doing. That is an old and well understood process for us. Um, So part of that just means that we also continue to add that much more engineering in it. Um, Just like you decided to say, hey, I want to do a little more than a three dot site. It's a sighting system on a gun. Um, I want to delve into this a little bit more and I want to just accept what we've conventionally had let me think about this that much more because we're 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 generally seeing a lot of um this attitude in in this kind of sector of like oh is that an obstacle i'll I'll just overcome it right that's that's how we tend to trend Mm. we're not generally like well i guess we'll give up and so sometimes we accept things and we just kind of overcome it and it can mean that we don't touch or investigate some areas on guns for a little while because we overcome it Um, But I think, you know, things uh, when we're talking about new site pictures, innovative site pictures, really investigating, hey, what's a maybe a better way, an alternative way to get someone to be more accurate, especially in a high stress scenario and investigating options, whether it's site picture or it's color. Um, We're also known for having one of the few companies that has a blue ring on our front site. Um, It's a little unusual, but we have these blue ring shooters that are absolute huge fans. That's an option. It's an option. Yeah, you don't have to. Yeah, that's an option. I've got got a pair of your uh, sights on one of my Glocks. Mm -hmm. Uh, What's the compatibility with other pistols? So um, with the Accurate line, we have them for Glocks. We have them for CZs. And we are talking about bringing in a new line. We have them Um, for all the shields, too. And we have them for the shields as well. And your front ring colors are, uh, excuse me, orange, white, and yellow. Uh, Oh, you do have the five. All five. Yep. Yep. And so for the rest of the types of manufacturers that we cover, we have 14 and more. 14 additional. And then... Yep. Oh, absolutely. We got Canic. If you go to our website, which is nightfishing.com, you can see that huge list, huge list of different okay. manufacturers. So you got a nice carry. variety out there. It's oh, gonna be yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. Most so, of the out there. And one of the things that we're also trying to do is an ensure that we have these conversations with manufacturers like Canic, which is an incredible gun, guys. I can tell you right now, the ability for someone to go into the shop and pick up an optics installed gun with multiple magazines, mag wells, all of the cool bells and whistles that more educated shooters will sometimes add to the gun afterwards. That is a fantastic solution for people. They love it. You have an incredible trigger in your guns. The Mete. This segment brought to you by <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Superior Firearms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. I love it, but that's the truth. So it's it's fantastic for people to be able to go pick those guns up and have the sights already on the gun. Yep. So um, along with the different types of manufacturers that we offer and the cool alternative and up and coming and different sight pictures that are appealing to people and designed for certain scenarios. We are also working with our industry partners and manufacturers to get them on at the factory as well. Yeah, we so need we to do OEM and because yeah. we're doing that currently. Yes, yes. Canic yeah. is actually working with Night Vision yeah. now to do OEM. so that we have OEM products that are already in the box 
coming with with an accurate. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you see, if well, only I knew a guy that could step it up yes, and help well, us develop. I, I, I would <laughs> because it, oh, here we come. And I know where this is going. No, all people need to understand is this: is it's really simple. Three dot sites are for amateurs, and <laughs> accurate sites are for professionals. And and if you if you are an amateur shooter, or you want to be an amateur shooter, then you just use three dot. Or maybe you just prefer three dot. <laughs> Just because you have no training, maybe you, you just prefer that. You don't have, you don't have, or you proper. can really take him off and do a black down rear with yeah. just the front side. <laughs> no, you can, no, dude. All right, I, I, you can we do that. that. That's well. that's fine. That's fine. Uh, actually, you know, there's there actually, if you go to their site, there is is it is it still in the pull down bar, right? The the science of sight. Uh, uh, I'm, I don't think so at this point, we had to completely revamp our website cause okay. it was time. Um, and we wanted to make sure we updated everything, um, for our consumers. But, um, I'm sure if you head to nightfishing.com, you can take a look and Google uh, and w- go in the search bar and you'll be able to locate that. Well, we did, we did produce actually a very thoughtful, intelligent explanation called the science of sight and you're like okay so you did this why just because you were bored or you wanted to do something I new or whatever i know that's in the product yeah, the, the, on the bottom yeah right the science of sight it's like why is color important mm-hmm. what what is the deal with color mm-hmm. why would you want two dots or instead of green three, or and blue so, or, or yeah whatever so that's be. that's all in there it's all very it's very very well researched and, and mm-hmm. uh, it's an so, intelligent website it so is. do you do you do things other than pistols, do you do shotguns or? So it's a good question. Um, so primarily we ARs. are handgun sites, um, absolutely. And we do have some products for ARs. We have a yes. A2 front sight post. Um, so if you wanted to put a tritium front sight on your A2, um, yeah. and it is just mil spec. So if, it, if it's a mil spec style A2 front sight post, we got you. Nice. Um, if you have the Magpul Ambus Pro, um, the match grade size, so the thinner blade, we have a replacement for that as well. Um, AK? With, uh, we don't currently have something for AK. Come on. Uh, but I will Step tell you, we have had some of <laughs> those conversations. If only we knew AK people. Um, <laughs> so we um, we have had some early discussions about that. Um, and I will say um, people have been hearing rumblings of this. We are going to make some forays into shotgun. We are so excited about that project. It is uh, yeah. Well on its way. That'll be that'll be a huge market for you. Yeah, yeah. I am oh, a absolutely. very very big defensive shotgun shooter. Um, so uh, that's like my You're world. Working with these guys. Uh, yet? I am. I am not working. Do we need with, to make a connection. I am not directly working with K, uh, Caltech on that um, right out of the box. But okay. I, I will tell you, um, I have a deep deep affection for defensive shotguns all day without question. So nice. I, I am. I am fully the person that it, I'm sure people are tired. Well, let's of make a connection after we get down here. In her office. <laughs> See, this, that's what this is all about. Yeah. You know what this is? Yeah. Yeah. This it's is, a, this is, the teepee. No, this, this is the temple. Is that the no, temple? This is, is that the, the church? church? The symbol the for building the bridges. <laughs> this is a symbol for building bridges. I'm, yeah. I'm temple perpetually on messing with the people, people side of things. <laughs> that's what we do here. Here's the door. Here's the steeple. Open the door. Here's all the people. I knew I figured out. We're building bridges. Did you not play that game? You I am having Get you excited about going to church we're bringing people together we're building bridges that's what we do but yeah so we we and you know we're really excited about that we continue to do tritium and other things and people will find on the tool side of um our website too we have our fobs there which is part of another sister company that we have glow rhino uh, but we're really just about that tritium life um across the tritium all about, about that, that life. tritium life, that life. Mm-hmm. all right rachel adam and lefty. Marty and Lefty and Lefty. Thank you very much. And we'll be back from the NRA annual meeting 2023 from the Keltec booth at the lead quarters. I just did deliberately took a deep breath because what follows. How far into this are we, Zach? Uh, debatably about 50 minutes. Okay. We can go 90 because we need to. This is, this is important information. I'm going to give you guys a real quick background. In, I became a United States Marine in 1987. In 1979 or 80, I can't remember which, uh, I was either in seventh or eighth grade because I remember we were in the junior high, the gym at my junior high, and they brought out they, that we were going to do CPR, and they brought out the Recessa Annie versus dummies. And back in the old days, you guys don't know this. Back in the old days, the CPR dummies had arms and legs, and they had a blue and red tracksuit, and it was Annie. 
right? And Annie, she uh, so she would have been like Jeffrey Dahmer's girlfriend. Yeah. So she had, um, she well she had a drinking problem because she always smelled like alcohol. Uh, now the recessa Annie's we worked on the, what they had what, between people they would just take an alcohol wipe and wipe off her mouth and nose. So we learned back in the day, we learned one man and it, because this was over a period of a few days, because I remember we, we went to the gym and we did it and we, you know, spent an hour or whatever in there. And uh, then we came back the next day and, and so on and so forth. We learned one man CPR. We learned two man CPR. We didn't learn Heimlich. Heimlich really wasn't a thing in the like. Maybe it was, but I don't remember learning it. Um, but we did learn CPR. We learned the, the counts. We had to memorize the counts. We had to do the and one and change and one and two and three and change. And you change. First of all, they don't do any of that anymore. They don't do two. They don't even teach two man CPR anymore because they realize that even though they spent all that time doing it, that it never actually happened in the real world. Um, the only people that ever did it were um, perf- like EMTs and nurses and stuff, but the average person never did two man CPR. So they're like, well, what? Let's just teach one, right? My point is this that was about 79, 1979 or 1980, that time frame that I learned CPR. Now, when I was in the Young Marine Youth Program, we learned basic first aid. I learned basic first aid. I learned, you know, how to the, make a sling out of a, out of a cravat or a rag or whatever. And, you know, how to treat basic burns and how to, you know, um, all, all that basic, it, essentially the young Marines borrowed the boy scout manual for, if you guys had the old boy scout manuals with the pencil drawings, you know, here's a broken leg. Here's how to make a splint. Here's, you know, all this stuff. Well, fast forward to 1987, I go to Paris Island, I become a United States Marine, right? I do that, and we go through military-approved first aid training. Other than the fact that we're all wearing, you know, the green pickle suits and stuff, uh, most of it was pretty much Red Cross Boy Scout stuff. You know, we, we did do the, you know, we did do the, uh, the buddy carry, how to get your buddy off the battlefield, you know, how to fireman's carry, how to, how to drag, how to, you know, all that stuff. There was obviously some military specific stuff, but as far as dealing with wounds, my entire formative years, you know, very little had changed in, in the late nineties, the mid to late nineties, I became a Red Cross family first aid and CPR Heimlich instructor went to the program, got my certificate so I could teach people how to do the Red Cross approved program, right? And very still from 79 to 97, 98, very little had changed. And one of the things that was common was when it, in regards to tourniquets, they would talk about it because they felt like they had to. Right, they they would talk about it, but they would say, as a last resort, after all other means have failed, whether it was the Boy Scouts, whether it was Young Marines, whether it was Red Cross, whether it was the Marine Corps, whether you know uh, whoever, everybody was singing the same song for years. Last resort. All other means have failed. Last resort, all other means have failed, right? Well, we get into, and of course, this is going on during essentially a Cold War. We get into an active shooting war, Afghanistan, Iraq. And what happens? Well, we sent our troops over with helmets and body armor. So we did a really good job protecting their core, really good job protecting their heads. But what's sticking out? Arms and legs, right? Because, you know, we, we cannot put, people can't function fully armored. You can't armor their legs and, you know, you can't put 10 people out there in bomb suits because it, they wouldn't be able to, to function. So what's happening? Well, 
first couple of years of GWAT, we're losing a lot of so soldiers, soldiers, Marines, troops, whatever, are dying from what the uh, the Army's uh, surgeon general is calling um, survivable lethal wounds or lethal survivable or whatever, meaning if that person would have gotten good treatment, even though it was a a critical or a life-threatening wound, they would have survived. And what happened? We had major bleeds, arterial bleeds in the arms, arterial bleeds in the legs. So what are our troops doing? Well, they're doing what they were trained to do. They're trying everything else, right? And then when they realize that everything they're trying is failing, then they're trying to make improvised tourniquets with rags and sticks and whatever, and it's failing. The, the, the Army did the study. The improvised tourniquets almost never worked. The, the, the failure rate on the improvised tourniquets was astronomical. And the reason is, is because, well, think about it. How often did people practice making improvised tourniquets and putting them on? Very rarely, if ever. Never. Why would you? The book says, last resort, all other means have failed. So we never practiced it. We did it one time in the class. They're like, okay, here's a rag, here's a stick. Pretend to do it. Okay, you pretended to do it. All right, now you're done. That's it. And then three years later, someone's laying on the side of the road, blood squirting out of their leg, and you're supposed to just magically make it work. Doesn't work. Well, to their credit, the, uh, the U.S. Army's, uh, I, I think it's like the Surgeon General's office or, or the, you know, they, they said, hey, we, we got to do better. We've got to do better. We, number one, we need better training. Number two, we need better gear. And at the time, the only actual commercially made tourniquets were medic were, were surgical tourniquets were ones that were used in in hospitals the field tourniquet or the trauma tourniquet or the you know the the cats the rats the soft tea the all, that didn't that stuff didn't exist go ahead and write it down it didn't exist so we had to like in a crisis in a crisis we had to come up with new tourniquets and new treat new uh, training now, the, the TCCC program, the Tactical Combat Casualty Care, actually was in its, it was kind of in its inception stage, and the U.S. Army Special Forces was, they were messing around with it in the 90s, but it wasn't standard training for every troop. The TCCC program initially was something that the Special Forces was, was they were messing with, they're thinking about, they're like, what if we did this, you know, da 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 well, that obviously all changed about 2005, 2006, because it was in the first couple of years of GWAT, it was, it, we learned some hard, painful lessons. A lot of people died that didn't need to die because our training and our gear wasn't up to date. It wasn't where it needed to be. And that's when I come in. So I went to work as a small arms and tactics instructor on a contract for the U.S. military as a military contractor. And I went through, before we started teaching, everybody in the, the cadre went through a training instructor development program. And part of that was going through the TCCC program. We went through the TCCC program, and I was very fortunate to have a couple of uh, combat veteran medical people, an 18 Delta and an Air Force pararescue guy who actually had real world in the field saves, who'd saved multiple dozens, hundreds, I don't know how many people they saved uh, and treated in the field. And one of the things that we introduced was tourniquet now. As soon as, it, it, you know, this whole idea of all other means have failed, try this, try that, try the other thing. And after you screwed around for five minutes trying to stop this guy's leg or arm from bleeding, well, then put a tourniquet on. That essentially equals death. 
The other thing that I learned was, uh, and his name was Ryan. His first name was Ryan. He was an 18 Delta, and he was really salty, and he had some strong opinions because all 18 Deltas pretty much feel in their heart that they are emergency room physicians. <laughs> they all feel like, um, and, and if... Well, you know if, the room is where the emergency is, right? <laughs> And all right, what and what what do you never say around an eighteen delta? Uh, okay, can you look at this? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you, if if you ever tell them like, "Hey, man, I got a this or that," and they're like, "Take your shirt off," wherever you are, yeah. take like, your take off your shirt, bend let, over, take off your shirt. Let me see. Now, come on, just just take off your shirt. Let me see what's up. Okay. Next thing you know, they're right. cauterizing a wound that you didn't know you had. <laughs> like, what is this? There's there's stuff in gauze in places and stuff, and they're, they're, they're stapling you or stitching you or whatever. Um, yeah. So one of the things that we learned from Ryan, uh, Ryan said, he goes, he, he looked at us all, he goes, we don't, and he said, all right, we've gone through this whole program, and we never talked about CPR. He said, you know why? Because we don't do CPR on the battlefield. He said, he said, you guys understand why? And we were all like, yeah. You know, by that time, we're like, yeah, because um, CPR does what? What is CPR? What does it stand for? Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. The whole reason you're, 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 you're beating their heart for them, right? So first of all, the only people you do CPR on are people that are having a cardiac emergency where, whose heart is not currently beating for itself. That's why you're doing it. If their heart's already beating, you don't need to do that. You guys understand that, right? If their heart is beating, you jumping on their chest, pushing up and down, is you're not helping the situation. You're trying to move oxygenated blood throughout their body. Yes. You're you're trying you're what you're trying to do is you're trying to get to make the blood keep moving around the body so that the organs in the brain don't die. That's what you're doing. But if someone is bleeding to death, because they have holes in them and you jump on their chest and do CPR, what you're doing is you're making them bleed to death faster. You have effectively changed the tune of CPR from staying alive to die MF or die. Yeah, to die. So we got a story here. Go to the New York Post story. This this keeps happening and it's got to stop. I don't know how it's going to stop, but it's, we've, we've got to make this stop. So this is a crazy story. The story is from the New York post, but the, but the incident actually happened in the UK, in the United Kingdom, where they never met a gun control law that they didn't love, where the people are effectively disarmed. And yet, this happened. Oh, she's really pretty. Yeah. She, she was. Oh, the, the uh, title is Angel Beautician L. Edwards Killed in Christmas Eve Shooting at UK Pub. All right. First of all, how does that happen? I thought the Brits were always telling us how we're barbarians for having guns, and they're civilized, and they don't have guns. Therefore, no one ever gets shot in England. Mm hmm a 26-year-old beauty shop worker was fatally shot in the head while partying at a packed English pub on Christmas Eve. They're allowing them to party together now? Elle Edwards had been with her sister and friends when gunfire broke out shortly before midnight Saturday at the Lighthouse Inn in Wallasey Valley. Or I'm sorry, Wallasey Village in Merseyside. The barrage of gunfire killed Edwards and critically injured a 28-year-old man who was taken to the hospital. A 22-year-old pub patron was wounded in the legs, plural. A 24-year-old man suffered a hand injury. And a 33-year-old man hurt his wrist. A female patron performed CPR on Edwards until she effectively made her blood bleed out of her body and killed her until first responders arrives. Arrived. Yeah. So that, the story just said a female patron performed CPR on Edwards until first responders arrived. Edwards was rushed to Arrow Park Hospital, where she was pronounced dead a short time later. Edwards worked 
as a beautician at a salon called Nova Studio in Whirl, where her co-workers mourned her violent death. So I wonder if this is, do, do they have the ability to say, it's kind of hard, right, to say, uh, you effectively push so much blood out of her body that you put her into irreversible shock. Yeah. See, versus- that's the thing is, is we've talked about this before. Uh, we had a, it was a couple of years ago or whatever. A detective was negligently shot inside of a police station. And the report said that officers performed CPR on him until the EMTs arrived and he died. Like, no kidding. Uh, and then this isn't the first one. We've had multiple situations where a person was shot and the response was CPR. Now, I, I do want to throw this out there because I think other people might be thinking it as well. If she was shot in the head, it might have been a little too late anyway. The CPR might not have actually done much. There's been people that have shot. Oh, people get shot in the head and, and live all and the time. Live. Yeah. Now, unless she was already like DOA from like brainstem. Um, That's why it's, it's hard to tell. Yeah. Well, even if it was, so remove the headshot from the equation. Somebody was shot in the body. It's still kind of difficult for a phys- physician, an ER doc to say, you pump so much blood out versus it was already going to leak out anyway, mm-hmm. right? Unless you stop it. Yeah. Right? Instead of doing CPR, you should be doing things that are going to stop the bleeding from stop the blood from we need the whole reason we put a tourniquet on first is because we need to keep all the red stuff inside of you uh that's what's most important russell brandt's song no inside of you no i don't know that you don't know that no i don't know sarah marshall Mm, man i I saw that one time when it first came out man well somebody will enjoy that i guess there you go so this is not the first time that someone's response to a gunshot victim was to do CPR on them. So the reason I bring this up is because I just wrote a freaking book. I I wrote the book actually long before um, I was working on it. I've been working on it since August, and it's finally out. Uh, It's called Beyond the Boo Boo. And uh, it's called Beyond the Boo Boo, Traumatic Medical Training for Citizens. The reason we did this was because there's so much bad, outdated information out there that I felt the need. And in the book, I detail what I just told you guys on the radio, that and more. When I started, when I initially started trying to teach citizens because, you know, in 2007, 2008, my thought process is if, if we can teach 18 and 19 year old kids to effectively save their buddies' lives on the battlefield by, with TCCC, why can't we teach American citizens, the average human, to do the same thing? It's not like an 18 year old in a camouflage uniform is somehow a genius and has a level of ability and skill beyond that of mere mortals, uh, that's not the case. If you can teach 18 and 19 year olds how to save people's lives while they're waiting for the, you know, the doctors and the ambulance to show up, why can't you teach men, women, teenagers, children? Why can't you do that? Well, the answer, obviously, here, 15 years later, the obvious answer is, well, yeah, obviously, duh, you can. But in 2004, 5, 6, 7, when you brought that up, you were a heretic. I tried for years to write an article extolling the value of traumatic medical training in carrying gear, and I couldn't sell it. Editors wouldn't buy it. They wouldn't publish it. They're like, you can't do that. So he took to the streets. I took to the streets. No, but, um, and I detail that in the book. I'm like, Guy Saki was the first one to take a chance. Everyone else was a coward. Yes. Why? Because he knew the difference between black napkins and white napkins. That's right. So uh, before this book could be published, this story happens, right? This woman, another, uh, did CPR. You know, like, 
what is what is going and and see that's the problem with cpr is people have been programmed to believe that is the that's what you do like someone's injured you do cpr like whoa 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 do you even know why we're doing it bleeding people don't need cpr okay bleeding people need to have you to do something to keep the blood inside their body that's what they need we've got to i mean i'm trying to beat this drum for 15 years i tried to get people to shut the f up and just put on a tourniquet quit fighting me on this and it wasn't just me and <sighs> well it's making a difference because there's more people that are carrying edc med kits uh today than there ever has been in the history of in, the world in 2000 ask jeff kirkham, jeff jeff kirkham the inventor of the rats 2007 2008 there were two people in the firearms media that were trying to get people to just shut the f up and get the training and carry the gear and our uh, late friend james yeager and uh, a guy named paul markle it uh james he left me with this task He's like, you got it. Carry on. So I did, I, I did the book. It's out there. It's available. There's going to be pimp hand approved copies. Zach's going to do a thing. Um, somebody's screwing with the fire upstairs. Me nice. Members of the grad program are going to get a special pre-order. So keep your eyes out yeah. for that. So I, for 15 years, I've been trying. I mean, we did. We, we've you know, we've we've talked about the pocket lifesaver, how that came about, the Boston bombing, my personal experience, you know, all of that stuff, all that stuff we talked about, and then one of you guys sends me this video. Um, you got the YouTube video, Zach, six days ago or, or a few days ago. Yes. I queued it up. So there's, I'll set it up for you and then I'll shut up. So there's these two people that I was not aware of. They're called arm. They call themselves armed attorneys. Somebody mentioned that in your, the, the comments of the discord. Yeah. They call themselves armed attorneys and they're supposedly pro two a right. So just, a, they did a YouTube video podcast here recently and I don't think we need to give them any airtime on our show. Well, I, I want. Can we just sum summarize? No, I want people to hear this because people won't believe it. People will say people will say that there's no way that in the year 2023 that intelligent adults would say this. Yeah, but using the instructor, like the how instructors work, wouldn't that confuse the audience? They mull it around later. They're like, OK, are we supposed to do this? Or are we not supposed to do this? Well, you can't fix a problem if you don't address the problem. You know, play this. Play, play it from, this is a man and a woman who call themselves armed attorneys. They have a YouTube channel and a podcast or whatever. And this is their take on trauma kits. Defense preparedness. Right. And that's where, I mean, when we look more towards self-defense, mm -hmm. that's where I think trauma kits are not a good idea yeah they they definitely might not be people would be mad at me for saying that but i i honestly believe that if i have a client who gives in a self-defense shooting i do not want them to have a trauma kit on their person yeah i think a good way to start would be like creating that baseline you don't have a trauma kit yeah um let's say i mean and the big downside to that is maybe you're less prepared for emergencies sure. maybe you don't have the capacity to mitigate you know, somebody losing their life or... Uh, Maybe that person's very close to you. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, there's definitely some downsides, but I think to your point of if you do have a trauma kit, I think the list of cons is kind of long. It's long. So, I mean, let's talk about it. So... Do you, do you want to keep going? You you want to hear what this, this, this bubble-headed bleach blonde has to say about why you should not have a trauma kit on you? Or do you want to just leave it right no. there? 
So this is where I am. And she's looking at it from an attorney's perspective the, of, of defending people. So she's probably got some, uh, and they address the big downside. They address the big downside of not being prepared enough to save the life of somebody that you love. If you're willing to be there while somebody that you love is dying just to be better off in a legal situation, you are, I would question the morals. You are a horrible, monstrous person. It's like they, they, I, they, I, I'm not going to listen to what she has to say about the, the specific reason. The for cons. I'll, I'll probably listen to it later. I'll listen to it later. But I, I just don't care. I would rather save the life of my loved ones and end up in prison. You, you're not going to. That's, see, that's the lie. But, but if it did happen, I would rather go to prison knowing that I saved my wife or my kids. There's, there's four. James Yeager, is, he wrote a book before he, he wrote before he died. He goes, he goes, if you are ever forced into a crisis, it is thrust upon you. You left the house that day, weren't planning to do anything. And the crisis is in front of you, whether it is a burning building, whether it is a rollover car crash, whether it is an armed confrontation with a, a, a robber, murderer, rapist, whatever. If you're forced, if you're put in there, there's four outcomes, four potential outcomes. And that's it. You are either going to be a live hero, a dead hero, live a dead. live coward. Ah or a dead coward. Yep. Those are your choices. He said, so you, the situation is right in front of you. You have, you didn't plan it. That's the way the world is. You know, you, you don't get to plan for these things. You're not going to get a postcard and you're at the, at, when it's all over with, you're going to be one of four things. You're either going to be a live hero, a dead hero, a living coward or a dead coward. The choice is up to you. That, you know, all the other bull crap aside, all the other hashtag EDC, Instagram, whatever, all the crap aside, at the end of the day, after that crisis is over, people are going to think of you in one of four ways. You get to decide. That's the only thing you get to decide. You don't get to decide whether the crisis happens. You don't get to decide whether the crisis materializes. You get to decide how you react to that crisis. And you're either going to be a, you're either going to be a hero living or dead, or you're going to be a despicable coward living or dead. And I don't think we use that enough. I don't think we use the term cowardice enough. These yeah. people uh, on this video are cowards. They're living cowards. They're currently living, breathing cowards, and they want you to be a living, breathing coward as well. I don't give two fat rats rear ends if they claim to be pro 2A. They don't get it. They don't understand, and they want you to be a living or a dead coward. Don't listen to these people. I've spent 15 mother loving years as detailed in this new book, trying to get people to shut the F up and do the right thing. Something else, you know, James and I had many, many conversations over the years about this, about you're going to get sued. There's too much liability, blah, 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 blah. Brothers and sisters, James put it to me this way. I'm going to put it to you this way. There is no greater liability than you purposefully killing a human. End of story. If you're willing to carry a gun and you're willing to look in the mirror and say, yes, I could use this tool to shoot a human. And if that human dies, well, then they die. You're morally okay mentally and morally justified in your brain i'm going to carry this lethal force instrument and if i have to i'll shoot that joker 
but you won't carry a trauma kit because there's too much liability involved. You're a coward and you're intellectually dishonest. You're lying to yourself. There is no greater liability than purposefully killing a human. Like, no, putting a tourniquet on, there's way more tour- There's way more liability in putting a tourniquet on a person than actually shooting them. No, there's not. The jurisprudence is there. And I, so, dear Lord, should we or should we not take the advice of the galactically stupid? Oh. That's why I said I had to be here today. And, and how the book just came out, it's just live, and boom, two idiots go onto YouTube to convince people to not do the right thing. The title that's of like, the video it inv- is, all right, it's it, 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 like, it, like, like, trauma. No, that's like it, it invalidates it. It's when people or right, we're not or what did I in my article in the article the truth about posers? I said, look, what what I do, what we do is I'm not giving you my opinion about cooking recipes. I'm not t- teaching you how to get red wine stains out of a shirt. I'm not teaching you to play tennis or ballroom dance where bad advice really if i give you bad advice about cooking and you make a dish that you don't enjoy it's no one dies you see that's the thing with our my world in this world versus the other world where people they're like well everyone has an opinion and everyone's opinion is valid and no everyone's opinion is not valid and some opinions are lethally dangerous like I said, there was a guy out there when I wrote that article. There was a guy who was thinking about getting training, was thinking about carrying medical gear. Then he saw that article by the posers that said, don't do that. It's better off left to the professionals. You shouldn't do that. If you do, you're going to get sued. These are all the reasons you shouldn't. So that guy. He was right there. He was about to do it, but he was talked out of it because this so-called expert with a show, a YouTube channel, whatever, talked him out of doing the right thing. And then in the future, time goes by. That dude is in a rollover car crash. His 10-year-old daughter has a severed arm because that's what happens in rollover car crashes. Limbs get severed. And you know what that dude does? He holds her with his hands as hard as he can, and she dies right in front of him. Because why? Why didn't he have the training? Why didn't he have the gear? Because a person talked him out of it. And his daughter now, he gets to watch the life float out of her eyes when he was going to. He had the intention to do the right thing. And then a quote unquote, well-intentioned person came along and talked him out of doing it. And now someone is dead who didn't need to be dead, except for the dangerous, dangerous opinions of idiots. Should we or should we not take the advice of the galactically stupid? Thank you. And that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're still there, yeah, if you didn't leave, I want you to have the best information possible. That's my whole life's mission. Has been trying to cut through the bull crap and deliver the best information possible. I wrote a book. A book is not training, but a book should inspire you to get good training. That's what we do. All right, Zach. Before we go any further, you need to cut that out. Of course, that's gonna that's gonna be okay. a, that's gonna be a standalone clip. Don't you worry. And tomorrow, I hope that everyone listening to me is a member of the Student of the Gun Grab Program. If you're not, you can be. Go to getsotg.com. Yep. Follow the directions there. Yes. And, uh, and you'll be better off. Uh, jihadi attack in Times Square. Did you see that, Jordan? No. 
Yep, there is a jihadi attack in Times Square on New Year's Eve. Uh, we're talking about some leadership lessons, uh, fighting fitness. And then on Friday, uh, we're talking about preparing for, quote, the average. If you prepare for the average, you're probably going to be sadly disappointed. Yep. So you want to make sure that you're here for those. Until we're together again, welcome to a brand new year. And remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. Thanks for staying until the end. Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. And remember, you are a beginner once, a student for life.